The joint hearing of the Committee on House Administration and the Committee on Oversight and Accountability will come to order. After conferring with Chairman Comer, we agreed that today's joint hearing will operate under the rules of the House Committee on House Administration. I note that a quorum is present. Without objection, the Chairman de may declare a recess at any time. Also without objection, the meeting record will remain open for five legislative days, so members may submit any materials they wish to be included therein. I'll now recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. I'd like to thank Chairman Comer and members of the Oversight and Accountability Committee for joining today's Committee on House Administration for our joint hearing. This is the third full committee hearing in the Committee on House Administration's American Confidence and Election Series, leading up to the reintroduction of the American, in American Confidence and Election Act, or the ACE Act. The ACE Act is the most conservative election bill to be considered in the House in over 20 years. It works to boost, boost voters' confidence and uphold the Constitution by ensuring states maintain primary control over elections, not the federal government. This is in stark contrast to House Democrats' efforts the last two Congresses, which would have nationalized our election system and centralized it in Washington, D.C. Voters' confidence in our election system isn't a partisan issue, and I'll note that voters from both parties have had questions in the past. The ACE Act will equip states with voluntary tools that they can implement to boost voter confidence and strengthen election integrity. However, while the Constitution clearly reserved power over our elections to the state, it explicitly gives Congress the responsibility to ensure the District of Columbia is governed, in, governed effectively, including elections. That's why it's important to have today's hearing alongside the Oversight Committee. The goal of today's hearing is to discuss how we can ensure elections and boost voter confidence in the District of Columbia by implementing key election reforms outlined in the ACE Act. For years, D.C. elections have been mismanaged. In 2015, the Board of Elections sent verification postcards to 260,000 inactive voters, with nearly 40,000 of those returned as, un as undeliverable. It's a big number. In 2015, the D.C. Auditor reviewed a list of people who died the year before. Every single person reviewed was still on the voter rolls and eligible to vote. D.C. failed its audit. That's a huge problem. When a person dies, they should be removed from the voter rolls. The ACE Act fixes this problem. In 2020, D.C.'s bad decisions continued. During the primary, voters waited in line at some polling, lo polling locations for hours, and some never received mail-in ballots. D.C. then made the decision to allow voters to submit ballots by unsecure email. This raises serious concerns about election integrity and erodes confidence in our elections. In the 2020 general election, the D.C. Board of Elections mailed every person on an unmaintained list a ballot. A post-election audit found that 11 percent of the 421,000 ballots sent were undeliverable. That's nearly 50,000 ballots. Two years later, during the 2022 midterm, 508,000 ballots were mailed, and nearly 90,000 were undeliverable. That's on top of hundreds of voters who were mailed incorrect ballots. Did D.C. work to address these errors? No. D.C. allows voting without a photo ID. D.C. allows ballot harvesting. D.C. allows non-citizens to vote. It's a huge problem. The ACE Act will fix it. We already know that left-leaning organizations accept millions in foreign money intended to influence American politics. We should all work against foreign influence in our elections. But what will D.C. do? Under a new local law, D.C. made elections more susceptible to foreign interference. After living here for just 30 days, embassy staff from Russia or China could cast a ballot in Washington, D.C. elections. This is beyond unacceptable. American elections should be for American citizens. Our nation's capital should be a beacon of democracy and a national model for excellence in elections administration. This isn't about who wins or loses elections, but rather ensuring voters have confidence in our elections. That's why we need the ACE Act. I'm focused on using Congress's constitutional authority to bring common sense election integrity reforms to the district and protect its voters. The ACE Act takes D.C. from being the poster child on how not to run an election to being the model for states to follow. The ACE Act will make 10 essential reforms in D.C., including one, requiring strong voter ID laws, two, prohibiting non-citizens from voting, three, 
requiring annual voter list maintenance, and four, stopping unsolicited mailing of ballots to unmaintained lists. Contrary to what many on the left have said, including what I anticipate we'll hear today, the data shows that states that have implemented common sense election integrity laws have experienced increased voter turnout. It's time to follow the facts and not the false narratives. If Democrats want to work together and encourage more people to vote, they can start by supporting the ACE Act to strengthen voter confidence right here in our nation's capital. Thank you. And I now recognize the Chairman of the Committee on Oversight and Accountability, Mr. Comer, for the purpose of providing an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we gather with our friends at the Committee on House Administration to consider the election laws of the District of Columbia and the provisions of the Title I, Subtitle D of the American Confidence in Elections Act, or the ACE Act. The right to vote is a hallmark of our republic. Americans' voices are heard when their ballots are cast. Americans must have confidence that our nation's elections are free and fair. Unfortunately, in recent years, we have witnessed firsthand how a lack of safeguards delay election results, creating uncertainty. Political operatives are abusing the practice of ballot harvesting in many jurisdictions across the country. Mail-in voting has been dramatically expanded without safeguards, hurting the voters' confidence in our election systems. For example, ballots are showing up at wrong or outdated addresses due to inaccurate voter lists. Ballots are even being sent to voters who have died. The primary characteristics of the American voting system should be transparency and certainty, not confusion and doubt. The American people should be confident in our voting processes and confident that their vote counts. And that includes in our nation's capital. That is why we are introducing the ASAC. The ASAC sets forth best practices to ensure a safe, accessible, and secure election system. Our nation's capital, which falls squarely under con Congress's jurisdiction, will adopt these best practices and serve as a model for the rest of the country. The system will require valid identification to vote, prohibit ballot harvesting by unrelated third parties, ensure public access to observe the election process, ensure security of mail-in ballots, prohibit non-U.S. citizens from voting in D.C. elections, and implement other common sense reforms like routine maintenance of official voter rolls. This act also respects the federalist approach to our election system enshrined in the Constitution. Instead of federalizing our electoral system, as our Democrat colleagues tried to do last Congress, this act respects the state to administer its elections in the best way for the voters of that specific state. The reforms of the ASAC will hopefully create a system that other states will look to as a model for a secure election system. Americans need to have faith that their elections are secure, and this legislation works to restore confidence in these systems. I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses and to discussing how this body can legislate common sense reforms to elections in Washington, D.C. that the states can look to as a model for secure and fair elections. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member of the Committee on House Administration, Mr. Morelli, for the purpose of providing an opening statement. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Stile, for welcoming us today. And uh, thank you to uh, Chair Comer and my uh, good friend, ranking member, uh, Jamie Raskin, and my colleagues on the Oversight Committee for being with us today. I would say this is becoming tedious, but I think we passed that point months ago. For at least the seventh time this Congress, in what is not even six months old, the Committee on House Administration has held an elections-related hearing to discuss this speculative, by all measures entirely unproven, lack of integrity Republicans claim exists in our elections. It appears the Committee on House Administration has turned into the Committee on Redundancy Committee. The hyperfixation on the part of the majority concerns me. It concerns me because it appears my Republican colleagues refuse to believe the overwhelming conclusion reached by nonpartisan experts by multiple presidential administrations, including the Department of Justice under former President Trump, and by scores of witnesses under oath in front of congressional committees and grand juries, our elections are secure. Instead, the majority has taken us deeper down a rabbit hole, desperately seeking some justification for their unpopular policies that would restrict access to the ballot. Today, they have really gone off the deep end. Our colleagues in the majority have brought in our friends from the Committee on Oversight to see if maybe some new faces can help them find what the Trump Department of Justice, the FBI, 
thorough investigations and audits in Democratic and Republican-led states, federal and state courts across the country, and the Committee on House Administration have all failed to find any evidence at all that our elections lack integrity. But today's hearing is even more cynical than past because it has the voters of Washington, D.C., who already lack full voting representation in Congress in its crosshairs. I want to be absolutely clear. Elections in Washington, D.C. are among the most accessible and democratic in our country. They are also among the most secure. The Conservative Heritage Foundation's election fraud cases database lists zero, let me repeat, zero instances of voter fraud in Washington, D.C. since 1979. But if we're being honest, this hearing is not actually about Washington, D.C. This hearing and the entire ACE Act is about giving Republicans a platform to impose extreme restrictions on voters across this country. They know how unpopular these policies are. They also know these extreme restrictions are necessary for them to succeed electorally. Because Republicans would prefer a world in which fewer people can easily vote, especially people they believe will not support their party's agenda. Perhaps instead of trying to disenfranchise voters, they should spend more time trying to make themselves more appealing to a broader swath of Americans, which might best explain why they've lost every presidential popular vote since 1988 but one. For the Republican majority, these hearings about so-called election integrity are about the past, about how they cannot publicly accept the outcome of the 2020 election, even though they know it's the truth. But for Democrats, ideas about voter access and voting rights are about the future. These are two different views of the world. One is cynical and seeks to exclude and impede to build barriers and keep voters out of the voting booth. The other, the one house Democrats hold dearly, is aspirational, optimistic, and inclusive. We have a vision of the Constitution so many Americans have embraced since before the Civil War. Americans who saw the urgent necessity of extending the right to vote to formerly enslaved people, to women, and to so many others. Americans who labored and organized and fought to realize that vision. My community of Rochester, New York, is an essential part of that legacy. The home and burial place of Frederick Douglass, who wrote the North Star from Rochester, New York. It's the location of Susan B. Anthony's historic vote in 1872's presidential election, where she was arrested for trying to participate in our democracy. House Democrats are proud to continue in this tradition, to walk the long but always righteous path toward real, full enfranchisement that so many throughout our nation's history have walked before. It's disappointing that our Republican colleagues have chosen a very different path. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize the ranking member on the Committee on Oversight and Accountability, Mr. Raskin, for the purpose of making an opening statement. Chairman Stile, thank you very much. Good morning to you and Chairman Comer and to my friend, uh, Mr. Morelli, the ranking member of House Admin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, what, what do you know? It's been more than a week, so it must be time for another hearing designed to inflict insult and injury on 700,000 disenfranchised Americans living in the nation's capital. Not only do our esteemed GOP colleagues want to block the statehood drive of our fellow Americans from Washington, D.C., and permanently deny them voting representation in the United States Senate and the United States House, not only do they want to roll back home rule, micromanage the D.C. Council, and blame them for the problems caused by their second-class political status, now they want to lecture them about democratic elections and voting rights while making it far more difficult for D.C. residents to register and to vote in the elections that they do get to vote for, for the few offices open to them, like D.C. Council, School Board, and Mayor. So while the GOP is pushing the ACE Act to empower states to clamp down on voting rights nationally, they also seek to directly impose this extreme anti-voter, anti-democratic legislation as a political straitjacket on the people of Washington, D.C. While Republicans claim to be advancing election integrity, the bill's obvious aim is to disenfranchise people and to make it more difficult to vote. And there's a history of this. In Democracy in America, Tocqueville observed that democracy in our country is always either shrinking and constricting under attack, or it's growing and expanding. And surely it's time for us to get back on the growth track and to stop these assaults on voting rights. But Republicans have thrown away the legacy of President Lincoln and now embrace the big lies and electoral corruption and manipulation of Donald Trump, who runs their party like an authoritarian cult of personality.
instead of bringing the people of Washington, D.C. into the union on an equal footing with the people of the 50 states, they seek to bring the disenfranchisement and political marginalization afflicting D.C. to people all across America with their proposals for tactical voter suppression, election repression, and registration depression. And what's the justification for their sledgehammer attack? on local elections in Washington today, there is none. D.C. already has free, fair, and secure elections for the public offices that are open to the people. In fact, D.C. has some of the most accessible and secure elections in the country. Through its pro-voter laws, D.C. has one of the highest registered voter rates in the country. And the local non-citizen voting policy identified by the chair is just for local elections, not for D.C.'s non-voting delegate in the House of Representatives. And this policy, by the way, follows up upon what was a central article of faith for the Republican Party in the 19th century, that people who come to the country as immigrants who are on the pathway to citizenship should have the right to vote and participate in local and school board elections. And I would uh, uh, refer to my friend from Wisconsin, a unanimous decision of the Wisconsin Supreme Court in 1863 called In Re Waylets, unanimously upholding Wisconsin's longstanding practice of granting non-citizens the right to vote at every level of government uh, in Wisconsin. And of course, President Lincoln, if you study the history, was a great champion of giving non-citizens uh, the right to vote in our country, which is why uh, a lot of people, um, his opponents, uh, anti-immigrant opponents, argued that he was in a public office illegitimately because of the immigrant vote in Illinois, Wisconsin, and New York. But in any event, um, uh, the Heritage Foundation's election fraud cases database identifies zero instances of voter fraud in Washington, D.C. since 1979. That's no election fraud in the nation's capital in the last 44 years. And DC's very strong pro-voter, pro-registration policies are clearly conducive to election integrity and have not led to any episodes of voter fraud that I'm aware of, but perhaps the majority has some in mind. Uh, the only plausible reason for this legislation today is for people who really know nothing about local Washington, D.C., beyond Capitol Hill, to use D.C. as a whipping post, a guinea pig, and a sacrificial lamb in their effort to constrict the vote and depress participation nationally. With this hearing, our friends in the GOP have moved from the macro suppression of representation, voting rights, and political voice in Washington to the micro suppression of local voting rights to keep people from even getting to the polls to cast ballots for candidates for the few offices that DC residents are actually allowed to fill. This bill is unnecessary, unfair, undemocratic, and unworthy of this body. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Without objection, all other members' opening statements will be made part of the record if they are submitted to the committee clerk by 5 p.m. today. Pursuant to paragraph B of committee rule six, the witnesses will please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witnesses have answered in the, in the affirmative and may be seated. I'll now introduce our witnesses. Our first witness, Mr. Ken Cuccinelli, serves as the national chairman on the Election Transparency Initiative. Previously, Mr. Cuccinelli served in the federal government, first as acting director of the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and then as the acting deputy secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Our next witness, Mr. Charlie Spees, is a D.C. voter and has been providing strategic political law counsel at the highest levels for over two decades. Our next witness, Ms. Monica Evans, serves as the executive director of the D.C. Board of Elections. Prior to joining the board, Ms. Evans served as the director of grants management at the U.S. Election Assistance Commission. Our final witness, Ms. Wendy Weiser, directs the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law. We appreciate all of our witnesses being here today and look forward to your testimony. As a reminder, we've read your written statement and it will appear in full in the, in the hearing record. Under Committee Rule 9, you're to limit your oral presentation to a brief summary of your written statements. I now recognize Mr. Cuccinelli for five minutes for the purpose of making an opening statement. Chairman Steele and Comer and Ranking Members Morelli and Raskin, I'm Ken Cuccinelli, Chairman of the Election Transparency Initiative, 
where we work every day to help improve the transparency, security, and accessibility of elections in every state so that every American, regardless of color, creed, or party affiliation, has confidence in the outcome of every election. Top of mind for today is the reintroduction of the ACE Act, which we support, and its second pillar concerning the election administration in the nation's capital. Obviously, Congress can do this under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, which gives Congress power to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over the district. The ACE Act, which features a host of state-based election integrity reforms that Congress can enact at their discretion, preserves this constitutionally prescribed balance by requiring reforms in D.C., but allowing states to choose. Let me be clear, the ACE Act does not mandate changes to state election laws, and this is an important factor in ETI's support for the ACE Act. We view Congress in a role similar to a state legislature as it relates to the nation's capital, but only the nation's capital. D.C. should be the gold standard for fair and honest elections in which every legal vote is cast and counted openly, equally, and with the highest standard of integrity. But how is the administration of D.C. elections going? Well, these distressing details uh, are contained in my written testimony, and the chairman walked through some recent examples. Um, but without question, D.C. elections are in profound disarray and have been poorly administered. Thankfully, Congress can and should exercise its responsibility over D.C. to repair its self-inflicted broken system. Current D.C. election laws are fraught with a host of anti-election integrity procedures and practices which unfortunately do more to sow doubt, confusion, and mistrust than they do to inspire confidence. For example, same-day voter registration and automatic voter registration, and I would stress registering to vote should be an affirmative act taken by an elector, not an automated command between differing systems and databases, allowing pre-registration of eligible 16-year-old residents who are then automatically registered to vote upon turning 18 inflating the voter rolls with potentially ineligible voters that are then ripe for mismanagement, abuse, and even fraud. No excuse absentee voting with a permanent absentee voting list. No ID requirement to vote after the voter has voted once in a previous election, just proof of residence, no photo required. Unsecured and unguarded drop boxes. And DC's infamous non-citizen voting law, which would allow green card holders and residents or those here illegally to vote so long as they're 18 or older and have been in D.C. for at least 30 days. That's right, non-citizens, including foreign nationals who've pledged loyalty to other countries such as Russia or China, would be allowed to vote in D.C. thanks in part to Senator Schumer and Senate Democrats who refused to preserve citizen-only voting when they had the chance. Even the Washington Post recognizes that elections in our nation's capital shouldn't be decided by the votes of Russian and Chinese nationals working at their country's embassies or non-citizens in the country illegally. Ranking member Raskin, who I sit before today, was asked during a February 6 Rules Committee hearing if he supported allowing non-citizen staff of the embassy of the Russian Federation the right to vote in D.C. elections. He replied, I've opposed Vladimir Putin's massive social disinformation campaign against American democracy, and I'm opposed to Russian subversion of democracy all over the world. So if they asked me my advice, I would say vote against that. And now you will all have the chance to do just that with the introduction of the ACE Act. The ACE Act would address D.C. elections through proven fundamental common sense reforms rooted in ballot and voter integrity, beginning with voter ID for in-person and mail-in voting. Voter ID, and particularly photo ID, is overwhelmingly popular among virtually every voting demographic, regardless of party, race, or where a man or woman lives, because it protects the right to vote in elections that are secure and fair. There are many other, Congress has work to do to fix DC's elections, and the problems referenced in my testimony today and my obviously longer submitted statement. These problems are America's problems, and the Election Transparency Initiative stands ready to assist in fixing them so the barriers to honest and accurate elections are replaced with those helping to guarantee certainty, trust, and confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cuccinelli. Mr. Spees, you're now recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman and distinguished members. My name is Charlie Spees. I'm in the political law practice at the Dickinson Wright Law Firm and have spent the past 25 years as an attorney in the election law arena. I've served as counsel to the chairman of the FEC, election law counsel for the RNC, counsel to the DC Republican Party, and have done election law work in over 30 states. My wife and I are DC residents, and I've worked on multiple challenges before the DC Board of Elections. If we can get reforms correct in DC, it will be a model for states around the nation. We are facing a crisis of voter confidence in this country, with polls demonstrating that 37% of Democratic-leaning voters and 71% of Republican-leaning voters share concerns about the election system. I want to be very clear. Free, fair, secure, well-run, and transparent elections are a cornerstone of, and certainly not a threat to, democracy. Laws that create safeguards to ensure every legal vote is counted and increase transparency are not, to quote inflammatory rhetoric, so-called Jim Crow 2.0. Effective election integrity efforts are not tedious, but instead they are important to increase confidence in our electoral process, which also results in increased voter participation. Georgia and Florida recently passed common sense reforms similar to the ACE Act here, and the result has been more participation and more confidence in the outcome of their elections. The ACE Act will implement basic election reforms while also supporting states' rights uh, to manage their own election processes by making DC into a model for fair, secure, and transparent elections. The two key principles of the ACE Act to, that will improve voter confidence are election uh, tools to make elections more effectively run and making elections more transparent. Locally, uh, you, the challenges with the administrations of elections in DC have been outlined by the chairman and Mr. Cuccinelli. The second component to improve voter confidence is transparency, which must include meaningful observation of all aspects of the voting process. Multiple states usually, recently used the pretext of COVID to thwart election observation efforts. And when you don't let poll workers see what's happening, then they aren't going, or you don't have security or cameras or on drop boxes, then people are going to question the process. Transparency demonstrates that the process works and uncovers issues to be remedied in a timely manner. For example, Florida saw huge electoral turnout across all demographics in 2022 after implementing similar reforms to the ACE Act, and that should be our goal with DC reforms also. The ACE Act contains numerous provisions to ensure DC elections are well run and transparent. Cleaning up voter rolls, adding voter ID requirements, prohibiting ballot harvesting, ending non-citizen voting, and expanding effective election observation. Despite dishonest and divisive cries of voter suppression, the American people overwhelmingly support common sense reforms in the, like this to the election process. Most of the for reforms in the ACE Act have been tried in Florida and Georgia, and Florida's SB 90 was a model for many of these acts, uh, of the safeguards. The fact is that in Florida, despite assertions of suppression, in 2022, turnout of, among all demographics was up, and the Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit recently upheld the challenge provisions of it. The same can be said about Georgia. After Senate Bill 202 was signed into law, Georgia received national backlash, but the reality is that Georgia saw record-breaking turnout last November, and a University of Georgia survey of voters taken after the elections found that exactly 0% of black respondents reported a poor voting experience. I'm focused on Florida and Georgia because the ACE Act is based upon their common sense reforms. And by bringing those here to Washington, DC, we can use it as a model for reform around the country. Thank you for the invitation to discuss the opportunity to use DC as the model for electoral reform. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Spees. Uh, Ms. Evans, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Still, Ranking Member, member Morelli, Cha Chairman Cromer, Ranking Member Raskin, and members of the committees. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today 
to address the operations of DC Board of Elections. I am here today in my role as Executive Director of the DC BOE, and today I would like to discuss the process of administering elections in the district. The DC Board of Elections is a charter independent agency comprised of a bipartisan three-member board who are each confirmed by the DC Council once nominated by the mayor. As the executive director, I am appointed by and serve at the pleasure of the board. Along with a small but dedicated staff, I am responsible for carrying out the board's mission. My office does not introduce legislation. We do not pass legislation, nor do we opine on legislation. We do not comment on the policy decisions made or proposed by elected officials. We implement election laws as they exist or as they may be amended from time to time by elected officials. When needed, we comment to the DC Council regarding the administrative requirements and the fiscal impact of implementing pending legislation. Similar to Congress, the DC Council solicits feedback from constituents and hosts public hearings prior to the enactment of any legislation. As you know, the District of Col in the District of Columbia, there is also a 30-day congressional review period for all council enacted legislation. Once a DC law passes congressional review, we administer it with neutrality and independence. Generally, DC BOE considers its efforts successful when all eligible individuals who wish to participate in the electoral process can do so simply, efficiently, and without barriers, and with confidence that their votes will be counted as they intended, and stakeholders have confidence in the management of the process and the result. DCBOE works and collaborates with state and local elections offices through its participation in national organizations, including the Election Center, the National Association of Election Directors, and the National Association of Secretaries of State. DCBOE interacts with the Election Assistance Commission. Our collaboration with the Federal Voting Assistance Program is to implement the online voter registration and absentee ballot request system for military and overseas voters. We are also pleased to work with interjurisdictional efforts that help us maintain our voter registration lists. Through the Electronic Registration Information Center or otherwise, our goal is simply to maintain accurate voter rolls in our jurisdiction, which is relative to states more transient and constantly in motion. We ensure the integrity of every election by putting measures and safeguards in place that warrant confidence in the elections process. We are transparent with our operations and our reports are published on our website. Our operations are open and accessible to members of the public. Prior to each election, DCBOE conducts logic and accuracy testing that is designed to verify the ballot counting program, prepare voting equipment, and certify that the voting equipment properly reads and tabulates votes. Tests are conducted prior to every election and may be observed by members of the public. Further, DCBOE conducts a manual audit after primary and general elections. Members of the public are able to observe and verify that votes are correctly classified and tallied. The audit report must be completed before election results are certified. We conduct 100% signature verification on all return mail ballots. Trained employees review scanned signatures from ballots against signatures we have on file. If there is a signature mismatch or if there is no signature, we have a cure process. Voters certify that they are the individual who voted by signing a voter certificate. DCBOE provides guidelines for poll watchers and election observers to ensure the orderly conduct conduct of elections and to protect the rights of all participants in the voting process. We have also been awarded for our efforts. In closing, DCBOE has a dedicated staff that administers elections effectively and with integrity. We work with other jurisdictions to share information and election practices. 
simply stated, we are charged with adhering to and implementing election laws that pertain to the District of Columbia. Thank you very much, Ms. Evans. Uh, Ms. Weiser, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Stile, Chairman Comer, Ranking Member Morelli, and Ranking Member Raskin. Free and fair elections are the cornerstone of American democracy, but they are facing serious and in many ways unprecedented threats. The problem is not voter fraud. We've just had two of the most secure federal elections in American history. The problem is a sustained anti-democratic push to reduce access to voting, meddle in election administration and equipment, and create a climate of fear around elections while under-investing in real access and security needs. This push has been driven by false claims and election denial, and it threatens to undermine the freedom to vote and election integrity in future federal elections. At the Brennan Center for Justice, a nonpartisan think tank and law center, we are tracking four kinds of threats. First, Americans are facing a more concerted effort to restrict access to voting than we have in generations. Last year, voters in 20 states faced 33 new laws making it harder to vote, and this year, we're on a similar track. These laws especially target voters of color, and it is not the case that turnout is up equally across all demographics. In fact, nationally, the turnout gap between white and non-white voters was larger in 2022 than in any federal general election since at least 2000, and it is growing. Second, our elections face elevated levels of harassment and threats of violence. Election officials in particular have been targeted relentlessly, but voters and even elected officials have not been spared. Third, we're seeing attempts to prevent certificate, uh, uh, we're seeing increasing efforts to sabotage election administration and outcomes from attempts to prevent certification of valid results to new laws making it easier for partisans to interfere in election counting and election administration. Fourth, there are increased threats of infiltration of election systems along with risks from aging and less secure equipment. These problems are not specific to the District of Columbia. They are national problems that require a strong national response. And I submit that response is the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act, which came achingly close to becoming the law last year, and Congress should pass that now. Today's hearing on the ACE Act underscores the central role that Congress ought to play in ensuring that every eligible American can cast a ballot and have that ballot securely counted. The US Constitution gives Congress extremely broad authority to set baseline national standards for voting and election administration in federal elections. Unfortunately, the ACE Act's mandates for Washington, D.C. failed to meet this moment. Rather than improving voting access and election integrity, it would roll back critical pro-voter advances that are working well in the district and across the country. For example, it would repeal same-day registration and impose one of the earliest registration deadlines in the country, transforming DC's registration system from one of the most accessible in the country to one of the least. And although Congress has the authority to make laws for DC, it should afford the district the same opportunity as other jurisdictions to set its own local election rules subject to whatever baseline pro-voter election standards that Congress sets for the nation. At bottom, the ACE Act would restrict voting access for DC's hundreds of thousands of voters, none of whom have voting representation in the Congress considering this bill, and that is unfair. The people of the District of Columbia deserve the same local sovereignty that other Am Americans have. They also deserve the full representative citizenship that can only be obtained via statehood. DC has a larger population, than Vermont or Wyoming, and its citizens pay more taxes than those of 22 states. DC voters overwhelmingly voted in favor of statehood. For the district's majority non-white population, this is not just a matter of self-determination, but also an essential civil rights issue. So rather than focusing solely on DC and trying to make the district a model for others, we urge Congress to address the urgent threats facing our national elections. Congress should pass sensible 
pro-voter, pro-democracy um, baseline standards that apply equally across the country, the standards in the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. Our democracy can't wait. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll begin our questions today, followed by Ranking Member Morelli. We'll then alternate between parties, and because this is a joint hearing, alternate between membership of each committee by seniority, respectively. Uh, we have 57 members here, about one-eighth of the House of Representatives, uh, and so I will hold us uh, quite tightly to the five minutes. Uh, I'll now recognize myself for the purpose of questioning our witnesses. Um, Ms. Evans, if I can start with you, um, you're the current executive director of the D.C. Board of Elections. Um, you don't make election law, but you implement election policy. Is that correct? That is correct. And so in, in Washington, D.C., if you're a D.C. resident, you'd need a photo ID to board an airplane. You'd need a photo ID to buy a six-pack of beer. Do you need a photo ID to vote in a D.C. election? When an individual um, shows up to a vote center, they do not um, need to submit a voter identification. So you don't need photo ID if you're voting in Washington, D.C. Although you that needed to correct. buy a six-pack of beer, you needed to board an airplane. Um, Ms. Evans, did D.C. just pass a law that would allow non-citizens to vote in D.C. elections? In D.C. local elections, that is correct. So starting in 2024, next year, non-citizens will be allowed to vote in D.C., correct? In local elections, that is correct. So Mr. Cuccinelli, if I can, Ms. Evans, Ms. Evans said not only does D.C. Uh, allow non-citizens to vote, they don't, allow, they don't require photo ID to vote in D.C. elections. Doesn't that mean that people who aren't eligible could vote in D.C. elections? Yes, particularly when they, w when you have a system that isn't running very well in the first place, yes. So, so isn't it important that, that people are who they say they are when they show up to the polls and photo ID would help ensure that? Absolutely, and that's actually the phrasing I recall Vice President Harris using in a BET interview about two years ago. So, Mr. Cuccinelli, under, under, let me shift gears slightly. Under D.C.'s kind of crazy new non-citizen voting law, doesn't that mean that embassy staff at the Russian embassy or the Chinese embassy, after being in Washington, D.C. for just 30 days, could vote in D.C. elections? That's exactly what it means. And so, if Washington, D.C. implemented photo ID for voting and allowed non-citizens to vote, an individual working at the Russian embassy could pull out a Russian embassy passport and vote in our nation's capital? That's exactly right. That's ridiculous. The ASAC. That's also exactly right. It, it, it's ridiculous. <laughs> this is the nation's capital. We shouldn't have Russian embassy or Chinese embassy staff voting in our elections. In fact, only U.S. citizens should be voting in American elections. Mr. Cuccinelli, the ACE Act is the strongest conservative election integrity legislation to be considered in the House in a generation. But the left kind of comes at it with these visceral attacks, the same attacks that they tried to use in Georgia when Georgia passed their voter integrity provisions. In fact, last night, the Committee on House Administration Democratic Twitter account said the ACE Act directly threatens the district and our democracy. Does photo ID threaten our di the district and our democracy? No, it protects it. Does prohibiting non-citizens from voting, is that a threat to democracy? It protects the democracy and the value of U.S. citizenship. Does maintaining clean voter rolls, is that a threat to democracy? No, it is a protection for democracy. So what are they talking about? They're talking about a 20-year-old narrative where they attack anything that makes elections cleaner and more secure and more transparent. It is not a new attack. It's been going on for a long time. This is just the modern version of it. We, we heard the Jim Crow 2.0, Charlie Spees touched on this, and Georgia was the center, center point of this over the last two years. That's where the real explosion took and, place. And after all this hyperbole in Georgia, the President of the United States leans in, makes false claims, the Washington Post comes back, gives four Pinocchios to the President, the false narrative is driven, Major League Baseball removes the All-Star game from Atlanta off this false narrative. Then we get to the election. What happens in Georgia? Was the, was the, narrative, was the Democratic narrative proven true? No, they had record turnout. The narrative was proven completely false. And the, uh, one of the universities down there, obviously, from the left side of the spectrum politically, 
polled after and found that 0%, 0% of black voters had a bad voting experience, and the black and white uh, report of good voting experience was within tenths of a percent of one another, over 72% of both populations. Which shows that putting in place good election integrity laws actually increases voter confidence and increases voter turnout across demographic groups. I think that's important. That's what the ASAC does. I appreciate your comments here, uh, and I yield back. I'll now recognize uh, the ranking member, Mr. Morelli, for five minutes for the purpose of asking questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin, uh, Mr. Cuccinelli. Did Joe Biden win the 2020 presidential election? Well, he's the president today, so yes. Yes, he did win the election. Mr. Speed, <laughs> is that, that's your answer? He did win the election. He's the Mr. president today, so yes, he won the election. Well, the question of whether or not it's the president and the question of whether or not he won the election are actually two different questions. In your opinion, did he win the election? Uh, he uh, is the president today, and he got the, and he, it's because he won that election, yes. Okay. And uh, he Mr. won that election because the Hunter Biden story was suppressed and because of Zuckerberg's. Wow. Uh, Mr. Spees, did Joe Biden win the 2020 presidential election? George Bush won the 2000 and 2004 election. Donald Trump won the 2016 election. Brian Kemp won the 2018 election. And Joe Biden won the 2020 election. All, will ch all were challenged. Um, okay, Ms. Holmes, uh, did Joe Biden win the 2020 election? I'm assuming you're addressing me, Ms. Evans, and um, yes, that is correct. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Evans, my apologies, yes. Um, Ms. Weezer, did uh, Joe Biden win the 2020 election? Um, I'd like to stick with you, Ms. Weezer. Um, in the Weiser, I'm sorry, my apologies. Boy, I'm really messing up names here. I really apologize to everyone. Uh, Ms. Weiser, in the aftermath of the 2020 election, um, the threats to election workers rose significantly. Um, many election workers targeted by internet rumors, public officials, even by the then President of the United States, um, and yet they're a key element in our democratic process. Um, common sense rules are needed to ensure election workers can keep their workplace safe and secure, and I I'm, uh, love your opinion. Um, first of all, can more be done to protect poll workers and others who facilitate and support our elections? And then does the ACE Act uh, do enough, in your opinion, to support safety and security of election workers? Um, thank you for your question. Um, absolutely, more can and must be done to protect um, election workers in America. The Brennan Center has been um, actually serving um, local election officials for the past, past several years, and we have documented an alarming spike in threats and harassment of election officials. Just, um, uh, just earlier this year, we found that nearly one in three election officials have been threatened, harassed, or abused for doing their jobs. 45% fear for the safety of their colleagues, and more than one in five are concerned about being assaulted on, their, on the job. And the concerns are actually the highest for election officials that are serving um, communities of color in America. Um, we, um, in addition to facing these threats, they have too few resources to address it. And, and across the country, election officials are reporting that they do not have the resources to ensure the physical safety and security of their their election workers, of their polling places, and of their homes. Um, we've estimated, and this is something that Congress can assist, but in addition, we need to have clear standards that ensure that election officials have the same protections as voters and others against harassment and intimidation. We need to protect their privacy and against doxing. And we need to have baseline national standards that actually reduce the incentive to threaten and harass election officials and depoliticize election administration. <coughs> These are critical reforms, most of which are in the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. They are not in the ACE Act, which doesn't at all address the safety concerns of election officials. To the contrary, actually, it has some provisions that increase risks of election officials by um, empowering um, partisan polling place observers and preventing election officials from being able to manage polling places to ensure the safety of election workers in the polling places. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cuccinelli, the subject of the hearing concerns the confidence of American uh, 
public in the, elect in, in the integrity of election process. And I believe Americans, if they have any reason to be concerned, it would be about the efforts of the former president to overturn a fair and legitimate election to retain power uh, and stop the peaceful transfer of power, which has been uh, so fundamental to American democracy. Richard Donahue served as the second highest ranking official at the Justice Department during the Trump administration. He testified under penalty of perjury uh, about a conversation former President Trump had with you on December 31st, 2020. Testified the President asked you whether the Department of Homeland Security could seize voting machines. Uh, it, frankly, a desperate attempt to overturn the election. I, I note that um, in your my colleague, Ms. Torres, has asked about um, uh, your response, which, which uh, uh, is at significant odds with the uh, testimony under perjury. I look forward to your response to her, uh, her questions. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chairman of the Committee on, on Oversight, Mr. Comer, is now recognized. Thank you. Mr. Cusinelli, you've already stated that you are like a majority of Americans. You oppose allowing non-U.S. citizens the right to vote. Is that Abs correct? Absolutely. On January 31st of this year, I introduced House Joint Resolution 24, a resolution disapproving the D.C. Council's bill to allow non-citizens to vote. Mr. Cuccinelli, would you have supported this bill? Absolutely. I'm glad you say that. I'm also glad that 42 of my Democrat colleagues agreed with you and voted in favor of that legislation when it passed the House on February 9th. Mr. Cuccinelli, do you agree that allowing foreign nationals, including foreign nationals from countries that are openly hostile to the United States to cast votes in the municipal elections of our nation's capital pose secure, uh, s severe security risks? I, I certainly do and find it a rather brazen invitation to foreign interference in a local election. You know, the, I have to state this, Mr. Chairman, that the, the D.C. mayor and, and, and city council members play a crucial role in emergency preparedness for the city. And now foreign nationals will have a say in who holds those elected positions? That's something that we should all be very concerned about. Mr. Cuccinelli, Title I, Subtitle D of the ACE Act would prohibit a non-citizen from voting in a D.C. election. Do you support such a provision? Absolutely. So the ACE Act uses what it considers to be best practices and implements them within the district, which falls under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Congress to have our capital become a poster child for safe, secure, and accessible elections. Mr. Cuccinelli, do you believe the reforms contemplated by the ACE Act would bring us closer to this goal? Much closer, yes, Congressman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Raskin, the ranking member on the Committee on Oversight, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I'm charmed by my colleague's sudden interest in Russian subversion of American elections, something that they used to describe as the Russian hoax. If only they had shown a fraction of the interest in stopping Donald Trump's sellout of the American government to Vladimir Putin on everything from NATO to Syria to Ukraine, as they're showing about the possibility that a handful of Russian diplomats could sway an advisory neighborhood commission election in DuPont Circle, America would be in a much stronger position today. Um, Mr. Spies, several provisions of the ACE Act seek to shield or limit donor disclosure, masking the true source of funding in our elections and hampering the ability of the FEC to enforce the foreign national prohibition. The ACE Act could lead to millions of dollars in hidden foreign spending hitting our airwaves and influencing our elections. Now, I want to talk about this kind of foreign interference. As you know, it's unlawful for any person to solicit, accept, or receive a contribution or donation from a foreign national. Do you agree it's important to ensure that foreign nationals do not make a contribution or donation of money or something else of value in connection with a federal, state, or local election? Yes. And you are counsel to the super PAC Right to Rise USA, is that right? Yes. In matter under review 7122, the FEC fined Right to Rise USA in America Pacific International Capital, APIC, a California corporation controlled by two foreign national Chinese citizens, $940,000. At the time, the third largest penalty the FEC had ever issued. The penalty followed reporting that identified two illegal APIC donations totaling $1.3 million to Right to Rise. 
Now, as I'm sure you remember, Mr. Spees, you were also fined by the FEC in this matter as the treasurer of Right to Rise. This incident is a concrete example of actual foreign interference in our elections. Shouldn't Congress be doing everything in its power to stop concrete actual foreign interference, like strengthening the ban on foreign national money and promoting disclosure of the true sources of election-related spending? Almost everything you just stated there was factually incorrect. I would suggest the staffer who wrote that for you should research what happened there. Long story short, what you're talking about is an American subsidiary under the control of U.S. citizens that gave money to a super PAC. Everybody included So what was the, the fine for? There was a conciliation agreement, which means that you settle with the commission, and the, and the PAC paid- Because of foreign money, right? It was not, it was never foreign money. The, the allegation was that it was U.S. money, but that a foreign national was the counsel at the foreign company by having legal review of whether it was permissible to contribute. That meant that you had a foreign citizen allegedly involved in the contribution, but it was never alleged to be foreign money. This was a U.S. money, but there was a okay, foreign I'm have lawyer to cut you. involved Send in us it. a memo about the so rest of it. All I've got the is the FEC decision. Just, okay, forgive me. I'm reclaiming my time. So it's just a I'm reclaiming fact. my time, Mr. Chairman. It's my time. Uh, Ms. Weiser, um, we just went through the unprecedented agony of a president of the United States trying to overthrow a presidential election, trying to get the vice president of the United States to step outside of his constitutional role and to declare the president who lost uh, the victor in the election. Uh, we heard people uh, not far from here chanting, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence, driving him out of the body. There was an attempt to substitute the loser for winner in a presidential election. We experienced a violent insurrection. There have been hundreds of convictions. Uh, people have just been convicted of seditious conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow the government. And now, um, instead of dealing with that reality, which poses a serious threat to the union, a dagger pointed at the throat of the United States of America, instead our colleagues come forward uh, with legislation to try to impose a photo ID on local elections in the District of Columbia. Do you see something as um, uh, strange or perverse about this response to the actual threats to democracy in America? Thank you for your question. Um, I do agree that the ASAC does not address these critical threats that are urgent and that Congress needs to address um, as quickly as possible heading into federal elections um, and um, instead focuses on actually rolling back voting rights solely in the District of Columbia. All right, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before I get into my questions, um, I, I just want to bring up something that I'd heard earlier, and I'm a bit surprised that the minority is uh, criticizing this committee for having so many hearings on a piece of legislation that is very important to Americans. Um, look, debate careful consideration and transparency is the hallmark of American legislative process. I look out at the crowd here and I can see people who are probably on both sides of this issue. However, it's, it's testimony that this many people are here to hear logical debate and consideration. Now, I probably shouldn't be surprised because in the last Congress, this committee was handed an 884-page election overhaul bill that was rushed through by the Democrats. 884 pages long. We had two hearings, two short hearings, and no markup before it was rushed to the House floor. This bill is one-sixth of the size of that bill. We've had seven hearings, including today. We've got uh, more scheduled to come. I don't see that as a problem. I see that as doing things the right and proper way. Now, with that said, Mr. Cuccinelli, Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution grants primary authority to states to run elections how they see fit and gives Congress purely a secondary role. Why is that important? Well, 
I would add one item as to why it's important that it gets rarely discussed since it comes from my old DHS hat, and that is the simple matter of, you know, we've had comments from myself included about election interference. If you have 51 different elections picking your president, we'll take the one national election, um, it is the security equivalent of a diversified financial portfolio. If you hack a state, you've hacked one state. If HR1 and HR4 of the previous Congress had become law, you'd have had one big election system. You hack one election system, you can actually affect outcomes much more easily. Um, the, the more you hack more states, the more likely you are to get caught. That is a high, high deterrent for a nation state. Um, so that, that is a very little discussed benefit to the states running elections. They are all done differently, District of Columbia included, um, and that's a real benefit for American security. But under our current Constitution, and I know some want to change this, the District of Columbia is subject to congressional authority, correct? Yes. And, and I'm going to divert a little bit because of something that was asked earlier. Um, we were talking, the chairman was talking about foreign nationals, you know, that, that live here. Now they can vote in D.C. <sighs> Mr. Cuccinelli, I know you're an attorney. Do we have foreign nationals that do live in the United States that are not citizens? Millions of them. Do we have those that have permanently made the United States their residency or their domicile that are not U.S. citizens? Millions of them. Let me read to you what the qualifications for the office of mayor in the District of Columbia currently are. No person shall hold the office of mayor unless he is a qualified elector. Would someone that we described, the chairman described earlier, that may be a foreign national that worked at the Russian embassy but now just decided to stay in D.C. and because of our current status of not uh, just allowing anybody to come to the country and stay here would not force them to leave. Is that a scenario that's possible? And would that person be a qualified elector? Under the current definition. Second qualification has resided and domiciled in the district for one year, immediately preceding the day on which the general or special election for mayor is to be held. Is that scenario possible, that someone who is a former employee of the Russian or Chinese embassy decided to stay in the United States, is qualified to vote in the District of Columbia, could run for mayor of the District of Columbia? Absolutely. Has not been convicted of a felony while holding the office, and then it talks talks about various types of employment. Now, I'm not an attorney, but I can read some legal documents. And from what I'm seeing here, I could be wrong, there could be something else in, in the code book for the District of Columbia, but what I'm reading right here, directly off the District of Columbia's qualifications, is that someone who is a, has worked for an adversary to the United States could run and become mayor of the District of Columbia. The, right. Is that what you read? Yes. Uh, I'll submit my other questions for the rest record to Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Ms. Holmes Norton is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the D.C. statehood bill is clearly constitutional. As leading constitutional scholars said in a letter to Congress, and I'm quoting, there is no constitutional barrier to passing the bill. In the 116th and 117th Congresses, the House passed the D.C. statehood bill. This Congress, the bill has 193 co-sponsors in the House and 45 in the Senate. The bill would admit the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth and reduce the size of the federal district, also known as the District of Columbia. The state would consist of 66 of the 68 miles of the current federal district and the reduced federal district over which Congress would retain plenary authority would consist of the other two square miles. There is no precedent for Congress admitting new states and reducing the size. There is precedent for Congress admitting new states and reducing the size of the federal district. The Constitution's admissions clause gives Congress 
the power to admit new states. Congress has admitted all 37 new states into the Union by simple legislation since the original 13 states. The Constitution's, Constitution's district cause gives Congress plenary authority over the federal district. Congress used this authority to reduce the size of the federal district by 30% in 1846. Not only is the D.C. statehood bill constitutional, the state of Washington, uh, Washington Douglas Commonwealth would meet the three traditional criteria Congress has used in evaluating prospective states, namely support for statehood, commitment to democracy, and sufficient population and resources. In particular, uh, in 18, uh, I'm sorry, in 2016, 86% of DC residents voted for statehood. Ms. Weiser, uh, why do you think DC residents overwhelmingly support statehood? Thank you very much for your question. DC residents, like all citizens, desire and deserve self political self-determination, a say over what happens in their community, and a voice in the national government um, a, that in, over what happens in the country as well. There is nothing prevented, preventing Congress from passing legislation tomorrow to admit the state of Washington Douglas Commonwealth other than partisanship, spurious and spa spacious arguments and dog whistles, like the statement from a Republican senator that the new state, which would be majority black and brown, would not be, and I'm quoting, a well-rounded working class state, end quote. I urge my colleagues to pass the D.C. state bill and to keep their hands off of D.C. Will the gentlelady yield? I yield to the gentleman from Maryland. Thank you kindly, Ms. Norton. I just wanted to uh, correct the record uh, about this. Mr. Spee seemed to uh, deny what I had asserted. I'd like to submit for the, the record the uh, conciliation agreement in the matter of Right to Rise USA, which specifically says on page four, Right to Rise USA violated 52 U.S.C. 30121A2 when its agent Neil Bush solicited a foreign national for a political contribution. Right to Rise USA violated 52 U.S. C 30121A2 by accepting APEX contributions, respondents will cease and desist and will pay a civil penalty to the commission in the amount of $390,000. And this was signed by, for the respondents by you, Mr. Spees, on February 13th, 2019. Do you deny any of that? I would be happy to explain if you'd like to give me more time. Sure, and we can also explain it by entering into this record how a Chinese-owned firm entered U.S. presidential politics August 3rd, 2016, intercept, Mr. Chairman. With, without, without objection, the, 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 the gentleman may answer Please. the question. What you just read is that somebody solicited that the conciliation agreement agreed that Mr. Bush solicited foreign, uh, a foreign national. And what that meant is that he spoke with the counsel of a Foreign, uh, foreign parent company about whether it was permissible for domestic money to be contributed. No foreign money was contributed to the super PAC. No, it, it, was, it says you accepted APEX contributions. If it was American money, why would you be entering into an agreement to uh, embrace your own guilt in the matter? Uh, I was well, the counsel for an organization that found it was better to conciliate than continue to litigate. Okay, so you did plead guilty to it. I didn't plead guilty, well, and the organization did not plead guilty. Time is you are misunderstanding you. how it works. Okay. The, 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 the gentleman yields back. The gentlelady's time uh, has expired. Uh, Ms. Bice is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I appreciate the witnesses for being here today. First, let me say that I come from the great state of Oklahoma, and in Oklahoma, we have some of, if not the most secure election laws in the entire country. 
Um, and, and as such, in 2010, we passed uh, a voter initiative to require voter ID uh, or voter verification at the polls. It passed by almost 75%. And I believe that if you were to put a ballot initiative together nationally to ask if citizens should be required to uh, verify proof of identification at the polls, that you would see an overwhelming number of individuals would support that initiative. Um, Ms. Weiser, I want to start with you. Um, you earlier mentioned that the, um, I'm sorry, when, when in 2020 and 2022, there were mail-in ballots uh, submitted across uh, the District of Columbia um, and mailed out to every single general election voter. Is that correct? Yes, I believe that is correct. And in 2020, wasn't it true that there were ballots that were not accepted and or voters that were not able to vote? And because of that, there was the opportunity for email ballots. Is that correct? I, I am not familiar with the email ballot, um, uh, w with whether or not there were email ballots. Ms. Evans, would you like to address that? During the 2020 primary election, um, individuals did not receive their mail ballots, and due to health reasons, we utilized the, um, the platform we have for military and overseas um, voters. And so we did follow the guidelines as far as acceptance of those ballots through that, um, through that channel. Do you believe, Ms. Weiser, that accepting email ballots is, uh, diminishes voter confidence? We, we believe um, that um, internet voting is not yet secure nationally as a standard um, to, to roll out across the country. Mr. Speaker, yeah, yes or no, it's not, it's not confident. There's, there's in, in lack of voter circumstances, confidence. In um, circumstances, small numbers of ballots can be done securely. Um, we would not recommend expanding that. At Mr. Spees, if I can ask you the same question, do you believe that email ballots would diminish voter confidence? Yes. Mr. Cuccinelli? Absolutely. And why is that? Well, because we are all in our own lives all too familiar with uh, the hacking of our own email systems, much less everyone else's. And so when you are reliant on that form for voting, especially in an arrangement where there's no identification even required, much less attempted, um, it guts confidence in the outcome. And isn't that a reason why we actually ask for uh, proof of identification when we go to the polls, Mr. Spees. We want to be able to ensure that the individual that is submitting their ballot is actually who they say they are. Is that correct? That's exactly right. And I would just note that the 75% statistic you noted in terms of voter ID for Oklahoma is very similar to all the national polling out there, which shows over 75% support for voter ID. And currently, voter ID is not required for mail-in ballots. Is that correct, Ms. Evans? That is correct. And you mentioned in your testimony that signature verification is used. How confident are you in signature verification? And if I can ask, do you sign your signature the same way today that you did 20 years ago? Um, I am confident in um, signature verification in the District of Columbia. We have trained individuals who have uh, numerous signatures for which they can use to um, verify. Where do you the get the signature information yeah. that you're we utilizing? Get, yeah. We get some of it from the Department of Motor Vehicles. We get some of it from um, actual voter registration applications. And when individuals vote in person, they sign the poll pads, and those signatures are captured. So we have a number of signatures we can use to verify signature. In the event that we are unable to verify signature, because as you mentioned, signatures do change over years and if an individual cannot verify that signature it is elevated to another level of review if the second level of review still cannot verify we have a cure process where we reach out to the voter and we get a signature and we get a certification that indicates that that is thank you signature. my time is limited so I want to make sure I, I get the last question and that is in regards to the um, mailed ballots that were done in 2020 and 2022 uh, every voter received a mail-in ballot for the general election, but there was a significantly high number of return ballots, 11% in 20 and 17% in 2022. What are you doing to ensure that you are um, providing due maintenance on the voter list uh, in the District of Columbia? Actually, the returned mail ballots assist us in our list maintenance process. 
once we get those ballots, that will serve as the first mailer in that process, and that um, will lead us to our um, process where we can move voters to an inactive status. The gentlelady yields back. Ms. Torres is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Cochinelli, during your April 27th, 2023 appearance, I asked you about your January 6th Select Committee transcribed interview, specifically about the several instances where various Trump officials approached you on the ability of the Department of Homeland Security, where you serve as acting deputy secretary, to seize voting machines. This included a series of attempts, including a December 31, 2020 call which was 58 days after the election and only seven days before the attack on the Capitol from former President Trump regarding seizing uh, voting machines. You testified before the January 6th Select Committee and this committee that the former president asked you about seizing voting machines. However, your prior testimony was inconsistent with Mr. Donahue's recollection of the call from President Trump. You said that Mr. Donahue's recollection might be a misunderstanding. This committee and I look forward to hearing from you, uh, Mr. Cochinelli, by next Wednesday as we seek clarity about exactly when after the election, the former president asked you about DHS authority to seize voting machines, particularly after you informed his campaign that DHS and DOJ lacked such authority. Uh, Mr. Chair, I seek unanimous consent to include the following items in the record. The select committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the US Capitol, transcribed interview of Richard Donahue, and the June 23rd, 2020, 2022 hearing on the January 6th investigation record, both of which include former uh, Mr. Donahue's testimony regarding former President Trump's call to Mr. Cuccinelli regarding seizing voting machines and the select committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol transcribed interview by Ken Cuccinelli from December 7, 2021. Without objection. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, because witnesses' credibility matters to this committee. Uh, Ms. Evans, you know, uh, Republican majority states have shown their voter priorities. First, by redistricting practices, gerrymandering every community that does not agree with their extreme agenda. Mm -hmm. Two, shutting down polling locations in communities that do not agree with their extreme agenda. Three, purging voters simply because they missed an election. And four, promoting disinformation in districts that are represented by members of Congress that do not agree with their extreme agenda. To all of the DC residents that are here, let me apologize to you for what has been um, put on the record about you and your right to be a citizen of a state, of a community where you live and pay taxes. I don't know a better example of taxation without representation than what you go through every single day under this extreme majority. Ms. Evans, please tell us a little bit about how DC makes pro-voter policies, um, how they put those policies in place to improve voter access, specifically how you reach out to voters who may feel disconnected um, when they hear disinformation um, and they see that there has been no progress in them being able to cast their votes for representatives uh, that truly represent their community. Please tell us about these processes. Thank you. Um, our processes are really around voter education and outreach, and we have a very robust division at DC Board of Elections, and we make information available in several different formats. We um, use print media, we use television radio media, 
We attempt to address the digital divide by um, sending material to residents in the District of Columbia, um, yard signs, door hangers, all of those are mechanisms that we use to get information to the um, residents and voters in the District of Columbia. In addition to that, uh, we hold um, roundtables and town halls to uh, receive feedback. And um, as far as the passage of legislation and um, laws, district council and the mayor do the same. Thank you, Ms. Evans, and I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Mr. Higgins is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Americans watching this are asking themselves, what's the problem with picture ID? What's the problem with photo ID? Why not have photo ID to present when you cast your vote in the United States of America? Americans watching are wondering regarding mail-in ballots, why would there be an automatic mechanism to, to deliver mail-in ballots or absentee ballots to every registered voter? Americans watching are wondering why, why would anyone expect that an election system that was designed to encourage fraud, why would you expect it to not experience fraud? Because corruption is born in the heart of man, ladies and gentlemen, not in the mechanisms of man. And Republicans in Congress are carefully and judiciously addressing the very serious concern of election integrities by focusing on D.C. election mechanisms for, for two primary reasons. One, the Constitution grants every sovereign state the right to determine the means by which elections will take place within that sovereign state. But Congress has unique authority over D.C because it's our nation's capital. And election integrity is indeed a national concern. So we must address this concern, but do so within the parameters of our constitutional authority. This is why we're focused on D.C. My, my D.C. citizens, brothers and sisters, you, you live in a beautifully unique city the capital of the nation that stands as the beacon of hope for the entire world. It's a, it's a capital city that belongs to all the people. And the people of America are concerned about election integrity. So we put forth legislation through our constitutional authority as Congress for Washington, D.C that could stand as a model for the entire nation, for the sovereign states that have the authority to determine the means by which elections take place within that state. And these common sense proposals of photo ID, legitimate photo ID to cast a vote, it's, it's, it's difficult to comprehend how anyone would oppose such a measure. The common sense proposal of limiting the numbers of ballots that are uncontrolled, delivered to homes across that voting area, collected in unsecured ballot boxes. This is common sense to control that. Might I suggest that we take a step back, all of us, and recognize the work that has been done by Republicans in this Congress to address this very serious issue carefully and judiciously by allowing and conducting hearing after hearing after hearing with significant debate, as one of my colleagues stated earlier. Ms. Holman Evans, you strike me as, as as a good lady with beautiful intent to serve her community. I, I sense that you're, you're very serious about doing your job, and I commend you for that. And I would ask you 
candidly here before the entire country, is there any single measure of the legislation proposed that you would consider to be a common sense control that should be enacted to help us secure our elections in your jurisdictional authority? Is there any measure here? In my role as the executive director, I do not um, provide opinions. I'm asking for your opinion. I'm giving you, I'm giving you the opportunity, good lady. Thank we you. We recognize, I respect you as an American. I've stated as such. I'm asking you, is there not one common sense measure within this where we could seek concurrence and agreement? This is the diplomatic way. Thank you for the question. As I mentioned, I am here in my official capacity as the executive director of DC Board of Elections. So you're gonna decline this not, opportunity it, to opine, it, is the way I, I'm reading that. Well, let me the, say, the, the general we're gonna move forward. We're gonna move forward the, it, as, a, as a body. Mr. Chairman, my the, time has expired. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Sewell is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a daughter of Selma, Alabama, and the ranking member of the Election Subcommittee on House Administration, as well as the author of the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, ensuring that elections are safe, secure, and accessible is something that I take very deeply personal. Voting is the cornerstone of our democracy, and far too often, the integrity of our elections is undermined by misinformation, false claims, and voter fraud during the election administration process. In the 2020 election, there was no evidence of a voting system being deleted, votes not counting, votes lost, or votes being compromised in any way. A recent study by the Brennan Center revealed that voter fraud is a very rare occurrence. Voter impersonation is virtually non-existent. And the few cases of voter fraud came from mistakes made by the voter or election administrators. Allegations of widespread voter fraud are attempts to distract voters from the implementation of restrictive voter policies that limit access to the ballot box. Contrary to what my Republican colleagues have asserted about the ACE bill being a model for the rest of the nation, the ACE bill is a dangerous policy that would have a severe impact on the rights of voters and on voting rights and access, especially to the District of Columbia. Washington, D.C. has the highest voter registration rate in the nation. D.C. voters can vote early by mail or drop ballot or drop box. Voting in D.C. is accessible to voters with disability and non-speaking and non-English speaking voters. D.C. has implemented pro-voter policies that has made voting very accessible to its residents. Even the conservative Heritage Foundation's election fraud cases database lists zero incidences of voter fraud in the, DC, in, in the District of Columbia since 1979. DC is a model and an example of the implementation of pro-voter policies that the entire nation should look at. However, the ACE bill is egregiously attempting to further disenfranchise DC voters by removing proactive voter policies that make their elections some of the most accessible elections in this nation. To be clear, DC voters deserve the same right to political self-determination as other Americans. The, DC, the ACE Act would restrict voter access to DC's hundreds of thousands of voters none of whom have voting representation in this body, Congress. It would do so despite the fact that Congress has long delegated its authority over DC's elections and local governance to the DC Council under the DC Home Rule Act of 1997. 
1973, sorry. Ms. Weiser, you spoke very eloquently of why it's so important that we give greater voter access. Can you talk a little bit about why prohibiting same-day registration and any registration in the 30 days prior to election would transform not only D.C. voter registration into one of the least accessible, but that would be det detrimental to take on as a model? Thank you very much for this question. Um, the same-day registration provision that is in place in D.C. and has been for 10 years is in place in 22 other states. It has been working well, and these are include red states, blue states. It doesn't states. include my state of Alabama, unfortunately, and I know <laughs> that my constituency would love to have more pro-voter policies and better access to the ballot box. Um, I indeed. Um, it, it actually um, provides better options for voters to register to vote. It works well. It is secure. And it actually has been shown to significantly improve voter participation, and especially voter participation among um, voters of color who are disproportionately um, voting at much lower rates right now. Not only do I agree with you, I would say that what we should be focused on is passing the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and not this ACE bill. Thank you, and I yield the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields. Uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to be clear about uh, what is happening here. The D.C. City Council has passed and enacted a number of pro-voting policies to increase voting accessibility and to protect the right to vote. Now, what we are seeing here introduced by the other side of the aisle um, is to pass legislations that would, legislation that would strip the DC government and its residents of their ability to determine the rules that govern their elections. So let's take a look at the policies that the District of Columbia has passed that are now under threat. Ms. Weiser, D.C. residents can register on the same day and vote, correct? That is correct. And how long has same-day registration been in place in the District of Columbia? Um, I believe it's been in place for a decade. Ten years, a decade. And in 2020, the D.C. General Auditor found uh, that in its audit of the 2020 election, that same-day registration came with, quote, no evidence of fraud or glitches. Yet despite this, the legislation before us would eliminate same-day registration. And in your testimony, you stated that eliminating same-day registration after 10 years of successful use would serve no valid purpose. So I ask you, given that the legislation here being presented by the Republican side of the aisle um, would be to eliminate it, what possible reason could we could there be to eliminate same-day registration when it's been so successful and so devoid of fraud? I can't think of any valid reason to eliminate this pro-voter reform that's working well in states across the country and has been working well in D.C. for a decade. There is no valid reason. In fact, this ACE Act, as Republicans are calling it, eliminates this provision. And um, we're also seeing that, they, that DC recently passed a provision to send mail ballots to voters to improve voter access while maintaining the security of their elections. They want to eliminate that as well. And as you testified today, DC's most recent elections have been among the best run in the nation. So what potential reason could there be to eliminate uh, sending mail-in ballots to voters? There is no good reason to eliminate that as well. DC, there are eight other states that um, have this policy in place and some for decades. This has um, also been shown to be fraud free and provide voters with reasonable options and convenience in voting. Um, and it has led to both greater voter turnout and more secure elections. So we have heard from experts that there is no valid reason to be eliminating same-day registration, mail-in ballots. If there is no valid reason, I think it stands to conclude that the only real reason um, that we see this push is political, 
It's a political reason. And in one of the blackest cities of America, to have, and to even have the idea of proposing the federal government strip voting rights in one of the blackest cities in this country that has a history of enslavement, a history of that, a, a history of uh, freed people seeking refuge here and then being punished with disenfranchisement, this cuts to the core of not just the present moment, but American history. I think what is striking about this is how afraid the other side of the aisle is of free and fair elections. And last year, Republicans were so afraid of a fully representative democracy in the District of Columbia that they insisted on denying the people of DC statehood. Today, Republicans are so afraid of democracy that they want to disenfranchise predominantly black voters who have been disenfranchised for as far back as when black people were enslaved in the United States of America. This has nothing to do with election integrity. This is about racial control, and this is not new. We have to look no further than an explanation from Senator John Tyler Morgan of Alabama, a former Confederate and a uh, slaveholder who said at the time, quote, in the face of this influx of a black population from the surrounding states, Congress found it necessary to disenfranchise every man in the District of Columbia in order thereby to get rid of this load, quote unquote, of black suffrage that was flooded in upon them. That is the true statement. History cannot be reversed. No man can misunderstand it. Straight verbatim from history. And it is shameful to see that recreated today. I yield back. The general lady yields back. For what, for what purposes the gentleman from Oklahoma seek recognition? Mr. Chair, I ask unanimous consent to enter a Wall Street Journal article um, dated 6 3 of 2020. DC lets voters submit via email after mail problems to the record. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and uh, I appreciate each of you, not only your service to this issue, but really trying to work at this to where there's a larger consensus built about not just what's fairness, but really who fits where, what, what the responsibility is for local people and what the responsibility is for the federal government. Uh, Ms. Evans, uh, you primarily are probably in the middle. By virtue of being in D.C., you have uh, our help and the help from your own elected officials. What information is publicly available or available to those who would wish to have data and information on not just mail-in ballots, but the time a ballot is requested, the day it's mailed out, the day it's received back, the day it's, is this, trans, is this available to a person or persons who would wish to gain access to the data and follow the data and be aware of that? Thank you for the question. And we do have information on our website as far as um, the number of mail ballots, the number of individuals who voted in person. We um, also have um, an after action report that we publish on our website after um, each election. We um, also have information regarding all of the um, Freedom of Information Act requests that we have received that is available on our website. We make every effort to ensure our um, process is transparent. And even while we are conducting elections and conducting a post-election audit, we um, have those processes open to members of the public to come in and um, view those um, for themselves. OK, thank you. Uh, the thing that I would like to see if you would be open to receiving is actually real transparency where you had a database that you work within that you would make available that says this person requested a ballot. This person was mailed a ballot. This is, I'm sure, what's available to you internally to where you're able to effectively run your operation. But it is not unusual where this information is available in other locations to where if someone wanted a snapshot, I suppose, 
that you would maybe form a different file if someone wanted to know who has requested a ballot? Do you then have a separate information that you may make that available to people on a daily basis, or do you segment this? How do you provide that information? Under the Elections Modernization Amendment Act in the District of Columbia, voters do not actually have to request a mail ballot. We send a mail ballot to all registered voters. And so that information would be consistent with registered voters as far as who receives a mail ballot. So the day before, two weeks before an election or three weeks before an election, you would have a list of all the registered voters. That would be available to anyone that would choose to get that list, or is it available to candidates, or how is that made available? Lists of registered voters are made available. You can even go inside of your public library, and we do post those lists of registered voters. In the Why inside a public library? That, library? That's is that one, transparency? That's one place, one not place. the only place. Uh, is it available if a person were to say, please give me a list of all the registered voters in uh, it, Washington, D.C. by precinct? It is. So that, that you would, then they would come and purchase or you would send them the data? Um, it is not something we sell. They have access to the data. We would um, correspond with the individual as far as the um, best format to get that information to them. So it could be that they would receive it all by, via email <coughs> or come to a database and then download it? We have secure mechanisms to, um, for large um, data files to individuals. So. Uh, when we have large data files, we do have to follow um, protocols to ensure that we are adequately able to um, get that information to the requester. So move, moving back to this question of when a person mails in their ballot, is their notification given to, or a person can ask for it at the time they receive a mail, that you receive a mail-in ballot? Are you speaking about the, the personal individual, the I'm personal voter? I'm talking about voter? any individual that mailed back their ballot. Yes, to we do you. have a mail ballot tracker uh, with intelligence. That's available to where people would be yes, available. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Good. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Connolly is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I feel like I'm in Alice in Wonderland listening to all of this. Ms. Evans. Ms. Evans. <coughs> Ms. Evans, over here. Loud and clear now. I want you to really be heard. So I'm listening to the two people to your left, and my God, I'm worried. It sounds like DC's a mess. It sounds like everything's broken. It sounds like people are cheating. They don't know where to go. They don't know how to vote. They don't know who to vote for, and it's all your fault, and DC's doing a terrible job that has discredited elections and really eroded confidence, especially that word confidence. Is that your view? It is not, I um, suggest. Loud and clear, Ms. Evans. Is it, that, did he accurately describe DC's voting situation? The processes in the DC um, elections, not accurately. Not described. accurate. How about like not accurate at all? Or should I be worried? I live in Fairfax, right across the river, where Mr. Cuccinelli used to live. And by the way, I'm delighted to hear a former Trump a member, Trump administration member, expressed concern about Russian interference in election. Uh, I think that's really a good thing. We, we've been saying that since 2016. Uh, so, confidence or not? Confidence. Should I be confident? Confidence, several measures and safeguards in place to ensure confidence. Miss, uh, is it Weiser? Weiser. Weiser, excuse me, Miss Weiser. Um, do you know when the Constitution was adopted? Yes, um, 1787. 1787, very good. Uh, well, actually, it was written in 1787. Yes, it was adopted in the next year. Yes. And uh, Mr. Cuccinelli cited Article 1 about the powers of Congress over the, uh, the Capitol. What was the Capitol in the Constitution in 1787 or 1788? Do you know? Um, I believe there was no capital in the Constitution. There was no capital. They hadn't yet decided where the capital was going to be. Is that correct? That is my understanding. And do you know when the capital, when we finally did decide there'd be a capital and where it would be? 
Um, I believe and it was in 1801. Well, 1790, but 1802, we established like a local government procedure. Yeah. And, and, the, and the primary author and driver of the Constitution, James Madison, of our home state of Virginia, he wrote in the Federalist Paper one year after he wrote the Constitution, and I quote, Federalist Paper number 43, that the, that the federal district would have a municipal legislature for local purposes derived from their own suffrages. What do you think he meant by that? Um, I, I believe he was um, expressing the same values of local self-determination that we've been talking about today and that the residents of DC have been asking for. What percentage, you're with the Brennan Center, what percentage of Americans do not vote in the presidential election? Um, what percentage? Do, do not, not vote in the presidential uh, election. Well, um, the uh, all Americans are entitled to vote in a presidential election. Not my election. question. How many do not vote? About 40%. That's a, it, uh, right? What percentage of Americans commit voter fraud every year? Um, a, a, it is an infinitesimally small right. percentage. So if I say to you, I got a problem that affects 40% of Americans, and I got another problem that affects almost no Americans, where would you put your investment? I would certainly put my investment right. in ensuring but Ms., free and But fair the, the two gentlemen to the left of Ms. Evans, and many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, want to somehow persuade us. The real problem is that infinitesimally small, almost non-existent fraud problem. And that's why we've got to restore confidence. We've got to restore integrity, which the bigger problem is suppression of voting, barriers to voting. Why not make it easier so 100% of Americans participate in their presidential elections uh, and not only 60%? But of course, that's not what they want. And they're doing all of this not because they're worried about process and integrity. They're worried about outcomes. And that's what this is all about. And so when you can't win elections, try to, try to select who gets to vote. It's an old practice and a reprehensible one. And that's why I feel like I'm in an Alice in Wonderland here, not addressing the real problem and manufacturing a problem that is designed to deny Americans their franchise, especially in the District of Columbia. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from the great state of Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, is recognized. Very good. First of all, I'd like to enter into a, the record an article by Martin Ostermule in the, um, uh, from NPR, uh, an article regarding mail ballots and the number that were undeliverable in the 2020 election. And second, I'd like to enter into the record an article from the DC list. Uh, again, a lot of mail ballots going out that were undeliverable this in the uh, uh, 2022 election. Without objection, so ordered. Okay, I've been a long opponent of uh, excessive use of, of mail ballots for two reasons. Uh, one, I don't think with mail ballots, unlike when I show up in person, we know for sure who filled them out. I don't know how, I realize you might have a, uh, a witness on there, but it seems to me there's no way to do follow-up or make sure the person who says is on the ballot, really filled out the ballot. And secondly, I don't know if we can make sure, like again, when I vote, we know I'm all alone in the town of Greenbush. Somebody's not whispering in my ear as to who to fill out the ballot. When that's filled out at home or a mail ballot, from what I can tell, there's no guarantee that that person hasn't been coached. Uh, Mr. Cuccinelli, in these areas in which we use absentee ballots, what efforts are being made to make sure that the person who filled out the ballot is not being coached by, say, their spouse, by their roommate, by their uh, uh, somebody from their union, uh, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend? How do we know that that person is not being coached in the current system? Well, we we do not. We know. don't know that they're not we being not coached. There's no way to know that. Well, if we had nothing but absentee ballots going out to people, and we were, say, in a country, a, a, a communist state, say, um, uh, uh, North Korea, what would we say about election results in North Korea if all the ballots were being filled out, uh, perhaps in the presence of a, a member of the Communist Party? What, what would we say about an election like that? That it's not a real election. 
Have there been any nonpartisan groups in the past commenting on the idea of uh, ballots being um, returned when you don't know if that returned on uh, absentee ballots? That, that's happened frequently, and I would point did, that did, you're didn't Jimmy Hill Carter wasn't he the part Carter of the Baker like Commission? You were thinking the same thing I was back in 2005. Um, they raised this as one of the areas of greatest vulnerability. Right. It could be something like North Korea, in which there's a person sitting next to the person who fills out the ballot, dealing with an apathetic person, an apathetic boy, you know, girlfriend, apathetic uh, member of. of in a, in a sorority or fraternity, whatever, right? And there's no protections that we can make sure that someone is not coaching that person, right? Not unless we're prepared to send someone from the government into every house, no. Well, that, that's horrible. And how do we even know that person even filled out the form? I realize, at least in Wisconsin, there's a place for a, 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 a witness. I think in some, are there states in which you don't even need a witness? There are. My goodness, no witness at all? Which states are they? Oh, well, there are a number of them. I don't have them memorized, but it's not, it's not a small number. Wow. So, there's, so when we come down to a presidential election, there are states in which somebody returns a ballot, and we don't even know for sure if that person filled them out. Right? There are plenty of those, yes. How can that be a fair election? That sounds like something you do in North Korea or communist China. That's going right here in the United States. People are filling out ballots. It's not like when I go to the town of Greenbush Town Hall and people know Glenn Grothman is filling out Glenn Grothman's ballots, right? That's going on in the United States and we claim we have fair elections? Only way to achieve the goal you're talking about is in-person voting. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's, uh, that's kind of shocking and, and again, we have situations in which we can have the head of the sorority, the abusive boyfriend filling out that person's ballot, and we have no idea, no idea when we count those ballots at the end if that's the way. Why wouldn't we go back to the system of having as many people as possible vote in person? or if they are in a nursing home, have members of both parties watch that person fill it out so we know that person is filling out and we know that person isn't being coached. Why wouldn't we do that if we wanted an honest election? Well, if you wanted an honest election, that's a good way to do it. Well, do you feel that uh, these past elections can be described as honest elections if there are states in which the electoral votes are determined by by votes that we don't know who filled them out or we don't know even if the right person filled it out if they weren't being coached. Can we call those honest elections? Would we call those honest elections if, if that was what was going on in, say, North Korea? Uh, certainly not North Korea. I don't think we'd ever do that. But, but there's a confidence problem with any of the systems you describe, even in our own elections. Well, hopefully, eventually, Congress steps in and solves this flaw. Gentlemen's time has expired. Ms. Brown is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once again, we find ourselves in the middle of an attempt to undermine the rights of the District of Columbia and its residents. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle consistently choose to focus on local DC matters instead of the problems facing the entire nation, like the cost of health care, addressing gun violence, and protecting reproductive rights and the LGBTQ community. However, if the majority is choosing to focus on elections in DC, I would be remiss not to bring up the voting rights of DC residents. The 700,000 residents of the District of Columbia lack the political representation given to America, Americans in all 50 states. So let's not beat around the bush. The failure to grant DC statehood is disenfranchisement of local communities, many of which are black and brown, plain and simple. Congress should never turn a blind eye to the voting rights of every person in this nation. That's why I am a proud co-sponsor of Congresswoman Holmes Norton Bill, H.R. 51, which would grant D.C. statehood and which Democrats passed in the 117th Congress and will work to pass every session until it becomes law. In his testimony in 2021 before the Oversight Committee, Wade Henderson, the president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, expressed strong support 
for D.C. statehood and the bill. He rightly observed that until D.C. has voting representation in Congress, and I quote, the effort of the civil rights movement will remain incomplete. Ms. Weiser, do you think that the racial demographics of the district's residents have played a role in the campaign against their disenfranchisement? Thank you very much for your question. Um, I, I do agree that the disenfranchisement of the 700,000 residents of DC does disproportionately impact um, voters of color um, in America who disproportionately make up uh, the, the bulk of DC's residents. And historically, it, the, the historical record is very clear that race discrimination was certainly played a, an important part in disenfranchising those citizens. Thank you. DC statehood and home rule are matters of racial justice. If DC were admitted as a state, it would have the highest percentage of black residents of any state. It is time for this majority to stop its selective interference in local politics and spend its time more wisely protecting the votes and voices of DC residents. It's time to make DC a state. And while we're at it, let's take a long, let's take long overdue action to protect the voting rights of all Americans. And with that, I would like to yield the balance of my time to the ranking member. I'd like to thank Ms. Brown um, for her courtesy and for that powerful statement. Um, I'd like to uh, ask Ms. Weiser that in, in the course of statehood admissions over uh, the development of American history, there have been 37 states admitted from the original 13. Um, are you familiar with the kinds of objections that were raised to certain states being admitted? It was said, for example, that Hawaii and Alaska were not contiguous, therefore they couldn't be admitted. Uh, Texas was a foreign country, therefore it couldn't be admitted. West Virginia used to be part of Virginia, therefore it couldn't be admitted, and so on. Are you familiar at all with that record of objections? Oh, I'm not very familiar, but I have read that. Well. Um, today, uh, it's said that Congress uh, doesn't have the authority to modify the boundaries of the District of Columbia, even though in 1846, Congress modified the boundaries of the District of Columbia in order to retrocede to Virginia, Alexandria, Arlington, and Fairfax County, when uh, Virginia slave masters were afraid that Congress was about to abolish the slave traffic in the District of Columbia, which in fact it did in the middle of the Civil War, so they were pressing about that, but it established the precedent that Congress has the authority to modify the boundaries of the District of Columbia. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 says Congress shall exercise exclusive legislation over that district to become the seat of government ceded by various states, not more than 10 miles square. It establishes a maximum area, but not any kind of minimum area uh, for the state. Would it be in the history of the enlargement of democracy and the treatment of all citizens equally to admit Washington as a state today? Absolutely. And I yield back. The, Thank you. The, the gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, Ms. Mr. Letourner is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to enter into the record an article from NBC Washington dated 10 one uh, entitled D.C. Residents Concerned After Mail-in Ballots Left Unsecured. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Elections are the bedrock of our constitutional republic. It's crucial that Americans everywhere are confident that their vote is properly counted and their voice is heard at the ballot box. Most voters support common sense election reforms, provisions like voter ID, ballot counting oversight, and prohibiting breaks or pauses in ballot counting until the vote tabulation is complete. We also need to make it easier for our troops serving abroad to vote and prevent outside third party groups from influencing our electoral process. Ms. Weiser, do you believe convicted felons should have the right to vote? Um, the, uh, um, thank you for your question. Um, uh, we do, suppo we do support um, restoration of voting rights, full restoration for people upon completion of their um, uh, time of incarceration. Does that include convicted murderers? Uh, 
that includes anyone who is released from incarceration and has been deemed to be fit to um, be a member of the community. Mr. Cuccinelli, I appreciate you being here today. DC has experienced many issues with outdated voter rolls and a lack of routine list maintenance. Why are accurate voter rolls so important for the administration of an election, and how does the ACE Act's requirement of maintaining accurate voter rolls assist in running elections? Well, they are, voter rolls serve as the foundation of who may legitimately participate um, when you have circumstances like an 11 percent failure rate and the 2020 statistics related earlier here and the voter rolls in terms of returns to DC uh, particularly when you are mailing out actual ballots you're literally sending in DC's case that's over 50,000 ballots that are hitting mailboxes or post offices without a legitimate eligible recipient based on their own system. That's 50,000 ballots that are floating around out there that were never requested by a voter um, and can be snatched up and voted by others, particularly when you have an unsecured Dropbox system to receive them. I've long been a proponent of the Federalist model of government. Do you believe that it's the best electoral system for our nation? And, and expound, if you might, on what role should the federal government be playing? Uh, certainly, the federal government should be making it easier for states to clean up their roles instead of getting in the way as much current federal law or at least court rulings lead to, um, unfortunately. Uh, I also believe, as I noted earlier, that separate elections by state uh, provide an additional level of security for us as a nation against potential foreign interlopers. Um, and that that is a tremendous benefit to us, though it does mean that the rules and laws as you go from one state to another will be different, as is allowed under the Constitution and has been practiced for 250 years, 240 years in this country. Uh, those are all benefits for the United States uh, of state-by-state -state type of elections. This is an important hearing today, and it's important that we draw attention to it. There are millions of Americans across the country that are concerned uh, that their vote doesn't count. They're concerned. They want to make sh certain that when they see a result, uh, less and less uh, commonly on election night, they want to have confidence that the person uh, that, uh, that got the most votes actually one. So this is an important issue for us to discuss. What you're hearing from the other side of the aisle is that there's nothing to see here. There's no problem. Uh, and we know that that's just not true. And we know that the majority of the American people support common sense uh, regulations in this regard. I think my home state of Kansas has some of the most secure elections in the country and serve as an example uh, for other states. Common sense things like voter ID, that you uh, prove that you are who that you, you say you are. That we're able to have, uh, that we're able to have ballot counting oversight. This is common sense stuff. The American people expect us to be talking about it and leading on it uh, here uh, in Washington D.C. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Ms. Lee of Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome back to all of the folks who have been continuing to stand up uh, for the cause of keeping hands off of D.C. I see you and I recognize you. Um, to Jump right back in it. Washington, D.C. has not had a single modern instance of voter fraud. The Republicans' own Heritage Foundation election fraud cases database lists zero instances of voter fraud in D.C. since 1979. Three D.C. based hearings in, and I can only think of one reason why we are here yet again to give and conduct all of this oversight on this one mid-sized city that doesn't have a state or any representation. We're not seeing this oversight over conservative areas. We're not seeing this oversight over majority white areas or white states. So it must be that DC has over 45% of black folks with a very suppressible vote because that's the real goal here, to disenfranchise black and brown voters. Republicans know that when people are able to vote freely and without odd constraints, like two uh, long lines 
uh, in places that they cannot access or rules that suppress their ability to access the ballot and to vote. When they can vote, they don't win elections. So they make it as difficult as possible and outright deny the right to many Americans. And the disenfranchise isn't just limited to continental United States. Ms. Weiser, are the people residing in the U.S. territories, such as Puerto Rico or Guam or the U.S. Virgin Islands, able to vote for the president? Um, I, I believe they are. Those same people are United States citizens, correct? That is correct. Millions of residents of the five U.S. territories, 98% of whom are people of color, are denied full voting rights, despite paying nearly $4 billion in federal taxes and having a population equivalent to that of the five smallest U.S. states combined. We're perpetuating a system of colonialism and paternalism. These folks do not have full voting rights in Congress or the Senate. Earlier this year, Senate Rep uh, Republican leader Mitch McConnell took to the floor of the Senate and said that, quote, it's about time the federal government provides some adult supervision for D.C. Let me just say, the folks who are duly elected to represent the city of D.C. are not children. The voters, the folks of voting age, they're not children. The last two hearings on D.C. were entitled Overdu uh, Overdue Oversight of the Capital City. They're not even trying to play down the dog whistles anymore. I was going to ask some semi-rhetorical questions to Ms. Evans to highlight the absurdity of this third D.C. hearing on disenfranchisement. I'll answer them myself, though. I was going to ask about the 535 voting members of Congress, how, of how many of those members did D.C. get to vote for? The answer was zero. I was then going to ask, of those 535 voting members of Congress, do any of them know more about or care more about D.C.? And it's nearly 700,000 residents than D.C.'s locally elected officials. This is, of course, conjecture, but I think you would probably say that these 535 of my colleagues do not know or care more about the day in and day out needs or desires of the people of D.C. My Republican colleagues seem to subscribe to this belief that D.C. residents are incapable of self-government and that D.C. residents need members of Congress from far away places to regulate their conduct. It's beyond offensive and it's un-American. I uh, will yield the remainder of my time to the ranking member Raskin. Thank you very much uh, to the distinguished gentlelady and for her trenchant comments there. Mr. Spees, I think you've given me an idea for some legislation as I read more into your case. I, I understand you entered into the conciliation agreement with the Federal Election Commission because uh, you were working with a wholly owned subsidiary uh, of a foreign company um, and a foreign national directed the contribution into uh, Mr. Bush's super PAC, and that was why you had to enter into it. But if a foreign national had not directed it, but it had just come from a domestic subsidiary of a foreign national, I think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that would be permissible under the law today, and I don't think that should be the case. I think a wholly owned corporate subsidiary in America should not be able to give money in our elections. Do, do you agree with that? The, the gentleman's microphone is not on. I agree with your reading of the law that a domestic subsidiary that is under American citizen control using funds gender generated in, in the United States is allowed to contribute. Okay, thank you. No, back. The gentleman, the, the time has expired. Mr. Goldman is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, here we are again. Yet another hearing, our third one in the Oversight Committee on the 700,000 residents of, District of, of, the, of the District of Columbia, which represents 0.002 of the total American population. Now, the subtitle of this hearing is The Path to Election Integrity in D.C. Election integrity, a term that we hear all the time from our Republican friends. And it's a term that is used all the time around the country to justify voter restriction laws uh, in numerous states with Republican legislatures. Ms. Weiser, since 2020, how many states have passed laws to restrict voter access? Um, thank you very much for your question. 
last year before the election, there were 20 states that had passed 33 new laws restricting access to the vote. This year, I believe um, we are, um, I, I will send you the, um, we are about to put out new numbers of what how many the, have passed. What is the this general year? justification for these uh, voter restriction laws? Virtually all of these are justified under the purported need to, um, to stop voter fraud, many of them using the same disinformation about election denialism and the 2020 election. So let's talk about voter fraud. Uh, Ms. Evans, how many cases of voter fraud have ever been proved in the history of Washington, D.C.? I don't have statistics as far as the history of D.C., but um, as far as Are you aware of any? There have been cases that um, have been brought to our attention of suspected voter fraud. As far as proven vote, voter fraud, I have um, no information. However, based on what has been brought to my attention, um, the numbers are less than 1%. Um, well, let me just tell you that according to the Heritage Foundation, the answer is zero. Yes. And you are correct that the percentage of voter fraud on a ba across the country is infinitesimal. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about voter fraud. Uh, Mr. Spees, do you know what the last congressional, which the la which congressional election was uh, last had to be redone because of widespread voter fraud? Do you know where that was? Indiana? No. I assume. Uh, well, maybe. But are you aware of North Carolina 9 in yeah. 2018? Yes, and I'm also aware of Louisiana, Indiana, North Carolina. Right. Well, in North Carolina 9, as I'm sure you know, there was a massive voter fraud scheme perpetrated by Republicans. And so what we have here is essentially a circular vacuum where Republicans are talking about voter fraud that doesn't exist, and when it exists, it's perpetrated by Republicans, to justify voter restriction laws uh, passed by Republican legislatures based on phantom and false information about voter fraud. That is ultimately the problem that we have here. And, and really, it is, as Ms. Weiser said, complete disinformation. Voter fraud is not a thing. It's not a thing that affects elections. Mr. Cuccinelli, let's talk about uh, the 2020 election, which I, I know you worked in the Trump administration as in a senior level Department of Homeland Security. Uh, what is CISA? CISA is one of the eight agencies of the Department of Homeland Security. And it oversees- so since 2018. And it oversees uh, our election security, correct? No, uh, it, that's not accurate. The states oversee that. CISA networks the states together to stay in touch with one another about threats to their elections. Okay, I'm not sure of the difference. But uh, you, you are aware that the head of CISA in 2020, who worked in the same Department of Homeland Security as you did, stated that the 2020 election was the most secure in our history. Are you not? I'm familiar with the quote to which you are referencing. Right. Yes. And do you have any basis, factual basis, to disagree with that assessment from the head of our election security agency in the Department of Homeland Security? So that is not an election security agency, and he had no factual basis to make the statement. That is the province of the states. The, Interesting. The general. All right. I'm glad we have that on the record. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Palmer is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cuccinelli, uh, uh, does the allegation of no or few charges of election fraud uh, indicate that there is no election fraud? <laughs> no, no, sir. I thank you for that answer. Uh, I want to ask you about the uh, ACE Act and uh, requiring the, the presentation of a, of a photo ID before casting a ballot in person. Um, would that make, uh, would that, lessen the probability of election fraud? It would, 
Uh, is that used in other states? It is used all over the country and in for many more things than merely elections. I have a list of about a hundred different things we require IDs for. Um, Including, by the way, in the District of Columbia. Right. Uh, before you can uh, uh, can Adopt do a number a of things. Pet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, the integrity of, of uh, voter files. Uh, I think it was about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, that the Pew Research Center published report and said there's 24 million Americans improperly registered. I think they said 2.7 million of them are registered in multiple states, 1.8 million of them are, are deceased. And um, is, is um, for instance, uh, the state of, of Michigan, according to uh, information from uh, from another group that's involved in, in voter integrity, uh, is 105 percent registered to vote. Now, for some of my people who who don't quite understand the math on that, that means there's five percent more people registered to vote than actually old enough or qualified to vote in the entire state of Michigan. Is that a problem? Uh, that sort of circumstance would be a huge problem, yes. How about over 800,000 inactive voters still on the rolls in Pennsylvania? Anytime you have a large inactive voter roll that isn't being um, 1. cleaned, 5 million, it's a problem. Uh, 1.5 million more people registered to vote in Los Angeles County than live in the county who would be eligible to vote? Yes, and I believe court ordered them just recently to remove 1.2 million ineligible or dead or gone voters. Right. So there are things. That's that, just the one county. Kind of that's just one county. Yeah. That's Los Angeles County. Uh, by the way, in, in the state of Michigan, there's 16 counties that are over 110 percent registered to vote, including one that's 119 percent. And I believe in citizenship and patriotism. But don't you think that's going a little bit too far? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I, I think the thing that we need to do is recognize that there's a large percentage of the population that has lost confidence in our elections. And we need to make sure that every individual citizen who's eligible to vote knows their vote counts. If there's the old saying in politics, perception is reality, I think that's true in, in, in other issues, particularly with election fraud. And uh, and, and it may be, as, as, as some have said, that there's little to no election fraud. But uh, from my perspective, there should be zero election fraud. How do you feel about that? I certainly agree with you, and I would note just as a lawyer, we talk about not just justice, but the appearance of justice, and I would say the analogy applies in elections. We want the best run, cleanest, most accessible elections. We also want them to be clearly cleanly run and with integrity. So the appearance is important to the confidence in the outcome as well as actually doing the job well. I've done quite a bit of work on this, and again, going back to the District of Columbia. Uh, in 2022, there was reporting that the uh, District of Columbia was at risk, is at risk of being formally removed from the ERIC program, which uh, assists multiple states in, in keeping clean voter rolls. This is due to DC's inconsistency in reporting on its own data, not somebody else's data, their own data. Can you explain how the ERIC system works and how this potential removal would affect DC elections? And is that a problem? So the ERIC system has its own controversy, but the, the idea is that um, because states that run their own elections in, in, and the District of Columbia, that when individuals might otherwise show up on two voter rolls, um, the two states work via the ERIC system to remove that person from the appropriate voter roll from which they should be removed. That does not often happen, which is one of the problems um, even in making the ERIC system useful even in that way. Do you think we need to add a, a, another criteria that proof of citizenship, uh, that states and, and the District of Columbia should be allowed to require proof of citizenship in order uh, to vote? I mean, when we passed the 1993 National Voter Registration Act, uh, then member Nancy Pelosi went to the microphone and argued that it, that it would uh, protect us from voter fraud. Would you agree with that? I, I absolutely think citizenship requirements are appropriate and the federal government should get out of the state's way in allowing them to, to uh, enforce that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Ms. Stansbury is recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna thank all of our witnesses for being here today. And I wanna just take this opportunity to say that there's one thing that I agree about on this committee hearing this morning, which is that there is an unprecedented attack on our democracy and elections happening across the nation right now. But it's not as our friends across the aisle would have us believe in this hearing this morning. In fact, the greatest threat to our democracy right now is the systematic erosion of voting voting rights across the United States. In fact, in 2021, more than 400 anti-voter measures were put forward by state legislatures and by this body, by the current majority in this body, that would put into place discriminatory voter ID laws, restrictions on polling locations that could lead to hours long waits, the, the elimination of early voting, bans on mail-in voting, and gerrymandering. These efforts not only undermine our democracy, they are a systematic attack on the voting rights of poor people and people of color in communities across this country. So it shouldn't be of any surprise to us that the only jurisdiction, local jurisdiction, that this body has any purview over, that the majority would haul our capital city in front of us to talk about your amazing and progressive voting rights legislation, which has actually protected the people of DC and their voting rights. I'm shocked, I'm disgusted. The bill that's being talked about this morning would continue that systematic erosion at the federal level and contribute to the disenfranchisement, not only of the people in this city, but in communities across the country that have historically been disenfranchised generation after generation. We have seen this undermining of voting rights in the Supreme Court with the gutting of the voting, uh, the, the voting Rights Act and the failure across our capital in the Senate uh, for uh, the Senate to act to protect voting rights. Luckily, here in the House, we have a strong group of Democrats who have been fighting to protect the voting rights of the people of this country and to carry forth the vision of Dr. Martin Luther King and of course the great John Lewis and the rights that they voted for, that they marched for across our communities. But in spite of these systematic efforts to undermine voting rights across the United States, there are shining lights. In fact, in my home state in New Mexico, we just passed voting rights legislation to protect and expand voting rights in our tribal communities, to expand opportunities for our communities to access the ballot box. And one of those shining lights is actually the capital city, Washington, D.C., which has some of the most important and progressive voting rights laws on the books. And I want to thank Ms. Evans for your work and the work of your folks who are making sure that the people of D.C have access to the voting, uh, to the ballot box here in this city. But I think it's important, I know we've heard a lot this morning about the impacts that these voting rights restrictions have had on communities across the country. But it's also important to talk about the things that we can do at the local level, whether that's in Washington, D.C., in states or tribal communities like mine. And so, Ms. Weiser, I know you've talked about this in your testimony, but I was struck in particular by some of the, uh, the notes that you provided about important things that we can do to shore up our voting rights system. So could you talk to us a little bit about the recommendations that you have for protecting voter rights? Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I will start by saying most of the recommendations that we have for shoring up voting rights are actually, um, ha have been um, passed by this body in the, uh, the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act. They include policies to modernize voter registration, make it secure and accessible for everyone, automatic voter registration, online registration, same day registration. They include ensuring baseline national standards so that everyone can access early voting and has opportunities also to engage in mail voting. It includes the restoration of voting rights for citizens um, who um, are formerly incarcerated to give them a second chance when they return to their community. That includes protections for election officials. It includes safeguards against interference in our elections. So th these are critical threats and Congress can actually put in place common sense measures to both expand access to voting while ensuring election integrity. And if I may, can I just correct one misstatement I said before? I was asked about the voting rights of individuals, um, citizens in the territories 
reason they can vote in presidential primaries but not in the general election, and that's actually not only a, a violation of policy but I believe a constitutional problem. Thank you, and I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that it should be no surprise that the party of the big lie on January 6th is holding our capital city in front of this body the to lady's time further undermine a population that is already disenfranchised the, the and that general, has already the had is, their voting The general lady's time has expired. The, the, the general lady's time has expired. The gentleman from North Dakota is recognized for five minutes. That we address the voting rights. The, the general lady's the general lady's time has expired. The gentle lady's time has expired. The gentleman from North Dakota is recognized for five minutes. Ms. Weiser, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of your written testimony on ballot collection restrictions. I mean, our hearing today is about the District of Columbia, and I don't think it would be a surprise to anybody that North Dakota and DC are two very different places. Uh, in my home state, sometimes you have to drive several hundred miles to access a post office, but that's not the case in DC. And your written testimony implies that restrictions on ballot collection disproportionately harm voters in rural areas with post offices uh, in very different things. But again, we're talking about DC. Do you know how many post offices are located in DC? I do not. I think it's 60. Uh, do you know how many square miles DC is? Um, I, I, um, I, I, I do not. It's just under 70, 68.3. Uh, that would mean by, I mean, that there's essentially a post office every 1.13 square miles in Washington, D.C. And I can, again, I can talk about the difficulty accessing post offices in rural areas and how to solve that. We've had that discussion uh, in, actually in this committee over the, since my entire time being in there. Uh, but when we're, when we're telling me that there's a problem with ballot collection in the District of Columbia, a city with a post office every 1.13 square miles, it sounds to me like... I mean, to my constituents, that's laughable. And I, I would be really interested in what you would tell me to tell my constituents at home. Well, thank you. So I, I was addressing the policy nationally, but in DC it is um, voters with disabilities and elderly voters, even if they have post offices nearby, may need assistance in actually, um, th the, they might not be able to use the benefit of mail balloting if they um, lack mobility or um, and don't have that assistance. Well, but that's not unique to DC. I mean, we have, no. I mean, it's everybody. And at least in D.C., you have a post office every 1.13 miles. That, that is not unique to D.C., but in most places, actually, um, ballot assistance is, in fact, permitted. And members of um, both political parties engage in it. It is a secure way of providing voters with assistance, especially those voters with disabilities, limited mobility, or, or voters who are very far from post offices. I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and outside of the policy involved around letting foreign nationals vote, which I find fascinating, I have some questions on what the safeguards exist in that space. Uh, I don't know how many foreign nationals are in D.C. at any given time, but I would assume that com comparatively, because we are embassies, we're the seat of the government in the United States, that it's significantly higher than the population as a whole. Do Mr. Cuccinelli, I think you and I would agree that allowing foreign nationals to vote in an election is a bad idea. True. But even if even if you and I agree that that policy is a bad idea, it exists, right? In and it's about DC and a few yeah. other places, yes. What safeguards are in place to make sure they're not voting at home? Well, n none yet. Okay. What safeguards should be put in place to make sure? I mean, you can come well, with I mean, a foreign the, the, passport and say, I'm going to vote in a DC municipal election. I work at the Norwegian, my wife's from Oslo, Norway, <laughs> Norwegian embassy. Are we checking with the Norwegian government if they're voting in two elections at once? No, I don't think we care, uh, honestly. I mean, we might care if the other election was in Maryland or Virginia and D.C., well, of course. But, but we clearly don't care if it's D.C. and Norway. I mean, I think that, but we should care. I mean, every, every, every state with a university deals with these issues. I mean, North Dakota has the easiest ballot. We're the only state in the country without voter registration. We have a 30-day residency requirement. You go to school at the University of North Dakota. You go to the school at NDSU. You're from Minnesota. You're from Illinois. You're from Iowa. We want you to be able to vote in North Dakota, provided you're not voting in Iowa. Why aren't we setting up those safeguards here? That's an excellent question, Congressman. I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I don't know what the closest D.C. election has been in the last 10 years, but I'm assuming it's, there's been something that's been fairly close. 
Probably primaries, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and, I, and I would note, I'm hearing occasional allegations that are partisan in nature, like the Republicans are trying to change outcomes in D.C. That's not going to happen. Well, you know who I don't want to change the outcome in any U.S. election? Foreign citizens that are voting at home. <laughs> I mean, voting is a sacred right. It's a sacred right in North Dakota. It's a sacred right in Minnesota. It's everywhere. But when you're voting in one place, you're not voting in another place. I mean, that is how this is supposed to work, particularly in the That is the not a requirement capital. in the D.C. non-citizen voting allowance. Well, outside of being terrible policy, I think the safeguards in place absolutely don't exist. And what you're telling me is that's true. Correct. All right. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, we've been going strong for two and a half hours, uh, and so we are going to provide uh, our witnesses uh, and, our, and our staff to take a 10-minute uh, recess, and then we will reconvene. The committee stands in recess.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. St. Louis and I are here today in opposition to Republicans' continuing assault on our democracy and in support of political self-determination for the residents of Washington, D.C. Let's get one thing straight at the top. The idea that Republicans care about election integrity in D.C. is a joke. Just two years ago, I was barricaded in my office right here in D.C. This is the party of insurrection whose supporters attacked the Capitol in an attempt to overthrow what? A democratic election. When Republicans talk about election integrity, they're really talking about voter suppression. They're talking about carrying on the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow by actively disenfranchising black and brown communities through legislation like the American Confidence in Elections Act to undermine voter access and fair and impartial election administration. And they're talking about maintaining anti-democratic control over DC, which has had a significant black population since its creation was majority black from the late 1950s through 20, the 2011 and remains majority non-white. The United States is the only democracy in the world that denies the residents of its capital voting representation in the national legislature. DC residents have been demanding voting representation in Congress for more than 200 years. And in a 2016 referendum, 86% of DC residents voted for statehood. Republicans want to pretend that DC statehood is a power grab for the Democrats, a power grab for the Democratic Party. They say it's a political a ploy to gain seats in the Senate. But that doesn't, just doesn't really make sense. So Ms. Weiser, if DC became a state, will Republicans be forbidden from running in its congressional elections? Absolutely not. Ah, okay, so they can still run. Okay, got it. Um, let me ask you, Ms. Weiser, in a democracy, should political rights be controlled, um, be conditioned on who voters might elect? Uh, no, absolutely not. That would be inappropriate. It would be inappropriate. Thank you. So DC statehood is not about one party or the other. It's about freedom. And it's about political self-determination. It's about overcoming the white supremacist violence of voter suppression in this here historically black city. It's about the voices of real people whose lives and whose struggles matter. So Republicans should stop the hypocrisy Again, I remember being barricaded in my office trying to figure out how to protect my staff. And my words were, if they come to this door, we bang into the end. And I meant that if you touch my staff, because they didn't sign up for this. They didn't sign up to be in a position to where their bodies are on the line. They signed up to do a work for the people of St. Louis. So stop the hypocrisy. Stop talking about don't tread on me when that's exactly what that party is doing to the people of DC. Stop trampling on their lives. Stop trampling on their freedoms. Stop trampling on our democracy. Stop holding DC hostage and let Congress once and for all grant the people of DC what they've been long demanding, statehood. Thank you, and I yield. Will the gentlelady yield? Will the gentlelady yield? You still got it, go. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sorry, were you still I, questioning? I, I started saying it, so. I yield back to you. Okay, well, I yield back to you. <laughs> well, you're very kind. Um, I, I, I was struck by um, the, gentle, the gentlelady from St. Louis's remarks. Um, the violent insurrection that took place on January 6, 2021, was a reflection of a sentiment that um, a white majority in the country can't lose a presidential election. And I think a lot of the legislation today proceeds on the same theory, that there's got to be something wrong with the elections if they're not uh, headed in the direction of Donald Trump 
um, and his team. So I thank you for giving us that juxtaposition, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask uh, unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from Christopher Arps of Americans for uh, Citizens Voting, um, an email of support from 6623. Um, and I also ask for unanimous consent to enter into the record a the Migration Policy Institute's profile of the unauthorized population within uh, Washington, D.C., dictating that over 20,000 non-citizens live in the district. I'd like to thank our witnesses for being here today to speak about the sacred right to vote in free and fair elections. I'll put it bluntly, allowing non-citizens to vote in American elections is a slap in the face to every American who fought and sacrificed for this right. In 2021, New York City became the largest municipality in the country to allow non-citizens to vote in local elections. However, even former Mayor Bill de Blasio a committed progressive. He refused to sign this legislation when it came to his desk. Even he agreed that there's an av a value to American citizenship and the right to vote. While I was chairman of the New York State Republican Party, I sued New York City's uh, council, uh, and the courts ruled against the city allowing non-citizens to vote, deeming it unconstitutional. Allowing those who are not American citizens to vote in our elections, whether it's here in the nation's capital or in any locality or state, it threatens the integrity and the security of our elections and devalues what it truly means to be an American citizen. Mr. Cuccinelli, Congress has given tremendous authority over the government in the District of Columbia, and this includes authority over elections within the district. Uh, on the other hand, Congress's role in the state and local elections is generally quite limited. Uh, what actions could Congress take to ensure that other municipalities don't follow the lead of New York City and open their municipal elections to non-citizens? Well, uh, what, what you're doing here with the ACE Act is obviously a good step because in the area you have the greatest authority, the District of Columbia, you are you would be advancing citizen, protection of citizenship, and I agree with you, Congressman, on the value of citizenship itself is is devalued when non-citizens vote, um, and appreciate, frankly, the role you played in New York in dealing with the city of New York's attempt to massively devalue its U.S. citizens' own votes in that city. Um, we, this this is a, a problem ac across the country. Um, it is being dealt with state by state. You mentioned an article by Chris Arps of St. Louis, if I recall correctly. Um, he has been a leader in uh, advancing this a bipartisan position, by the way, uh, of uh, going state by state to try to reinforce what most Americans always assumed to be the case and that is that only Americans get to vote in American elections. Absolutely. Uh, D.C.'s radical proposal to allow non-citizens to vote in D.C. elections has rightfully received a tremendous amount of attention. Uh, I mean, we've, frankly, I mean, we've welcomed employees of Vladimir Putin and President Xi to vote in our district elections here, you know, people that are here on, on a permanent basis. Uh, but I suspect that that isn't the only anti-election integrity measure that's been adopted by the D.C. Council in recent years. Can you talk about what else in D.C.'s election law co compromises election integrity and should be fixed? So it's been mentioned here repeatedly that the Heritage Election Fraud Database doesn't contain any D.C. cases. I would note that um, no of personal offense to my fellow witness here, but D.C.'s administration of its elections over the years is so sloppy and careless, they don't have the measures in place to catch fraudulent activity. They don't have the desire to do it. And even if they did, the D.C. Council's office, it would, it would be nearly a miracle to see the D.C. Council's office actually advance a prosecution. And when you have that behind you, I know as a former attorney general, and you're on the front lines, you don't bother putting the cases together because you know they're not going to go forward. Uh, what other anti-election integrity measures do you envision that they could attempt to enact in the months ahead? Well, certainly what's contained in the ACE Act, photo ID is the most obvious, um, including its application to mail-in ballots so far as they're allowed. Perhaps uh, the next large-scale change that would be beneficial in terms of confidence and reducing the prospect for fraud is stopping the mailing out, unsolicited mailing out of ballots, not applications, but ballots. 
themselves. Thank you. And, I, and I'll say it again. Allowing non-citizens to vote in American elections is a slap in the face to every American who fought and sacrificed for this sacred right. Our nation's capital and many other cities around the country should never throw away centuries of progress and sacrifice. I have fought this for years, dating back to my time uh, as a statewide leader in New York, and I will continue to fight for American values here in Congress. It's not only a national security threat, it's a slap in the face to American citizens who cherish our freedom. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Garcia is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just wanted to start off by saying that I take um, voting uh, very seriously. I appreciate um, all the discussion around voting. I, I'm an immigrant, and so for me, the day I raised my right hand and took an oath to our country and constitution and earned the right to vote, I was in my 20s. It was, to this day, the most transformational moment of my life. And it's something that is incredibly important to me personally. And so I just want to thank um, everyone's work on on voting rights. Now, I consider myself a patriotic immigrant. I'm also a former mayor uh, and someone who cares deeply about democracy. Um, and like many of our conversations in this committee, I find today's conversation deeply disturbing and offensive in so many ways. Now, this committee has now for the third time chosen to waste our time on uh, working and trying to figure out uh, local laws and what DC should or should not be doing. I loved my time in local government and as mayor of my community and when I served on the council, but I oftentimes feel like I am back on my city council whenever we bring up the District of Columbia here in DC. And I encourage my house colleagues that if they wanna get so involved in local government, they should run for office here in Washington, DC. There are plenty of city council seats that are open. There are plenty of positions to be appointed to, and they should stop making DC their partisan playground for attacking elections, attacking mostly non-white voters, and attacking our democracy. Now, DC residents are Americans who deserve the same rights and privileges as anyone else. Folks here are working hard to ensure that people have access to the ballot box, and we don't need House Republicans pushing voter suppression and a voter suppression campaign on DC. I remind us that DC has the highest voter registration rate, I believe, in the nation. Now, let's start with some facts. There's no crisis of American confidence in elections except for when Donald Trump created one across the country. Now, many people rightly feared for the integrity of our elections when Trump welcomed the Russian support and interference in 2016. This whole rant about elections and the destruction of our democracy starts with former President Donald Trump. Now, let's re be uh, real clear, Joe Biden won the last election as much to the uh, dismay um, of Donald Trump and many House Republicans by earning seven million more votes and 74 more electoral college votes than Donald Trump. Now, with Donald Trump's ego, disregard for the Constitution and the rule of law and his pathological fear of being a loser that led him to lie to the American people. Many people knew then and know now that he continues to lie and replete this great lie to cover for him and his loss. Now, there is no evidence of voter fraud in DC or anywhere else. The District of Columbia mailed each registered DC voter a mail ballot for the 2020 election, and over 200,000 residents voted by mail with no evidence of voting fraud. Now, this legislation that Republicans are discussing and wanna promote will actually make it harder to vote in DC and will have less of a voice for the American people. So I, I just wanna repeat that despite the fact that it keeps being mentioned, there is no voter of some widespread voter fraud happening in DC. Ms. Weiser, can you remind us how common in-person voter fraud actually is? An American is more likely to be struck by lightning than to commit in-person voter fraud according to multiple studies over decades. Absolutely, thank you. And if, and if voter ID laws don't actually work or solve any problems, uh, their impact is really about making, making it harder for Americans and, uh, and, uh, to vote. And so we should be clear, voter ID requirements disproportionately affect non-white voters. That is clear, and I think that's been, that has been um, uh, studied. Uh, Ms. Weiser, can you remind the committee what happened after the passage of the Texas 2021 voter suppression omnibus bill, which required the presentation uh, of driver's licenses, absentee ballot applications, and wh what happened then? 
The Brennan Center actually studied the impact of just one of the provisions in this massive voter restriction bill, which is the requirement that voter IDs, um, ID numbers be provided with absentee ballots and absentee ballot applications. We found that tens of thousands of ballots um, were rejected. 10% of those ballots, that um, mail ballots, and that it was disproportionately African American voters and Latino and Asian voters. 19% of Latino and Asian ballots were rejected, and um, uh, and 16% uh, of African. We we should be we should be holding hearings about that travesty. We should be holding hearings about disenfranchising non-white voters across this country that is happening in state legislature after after state legislature. So I just want to thank you for your work. I want to thank and once again restate my position that Washington, D.C. Uh, should be a state and the people here deserve the same rights as anybody else in this country. And I want to thank you for your time. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just touch on a couple of points. First, uh, one, I thought everybody had agreed that the Russian interference alleged in the 2016 campaign had pretty much been debunked, but apparently not. I heard it here today just a few seconds ago. I will, will, say, will the gentleman yield first? I will not yield. I would say in addition that the mail ballots uh, in D.C., I have a friend who lives up here, as you might know, several of us do, and they received multiple opportunities to vote. They obviously didn't exercise that. And in that regard, I would ask General Cuccinelli, um, we have heard today that the Heritage Election Fraud Database shows no cases of fraud in D.C. Do you have an explanation why that might be? I uh, certainly do, as the the... the nature of the system in D.C. is very poor, um, so catching it in the first place is much more difficult. There are other jurisdictions that do a much better job of that, but I will also tell you as a former attorney general that no one bothers to put those cases together when you have an office like the D.C. Council's office, which it would take a near miracle for them to bring a voter fraud case. So when you don't have a prosecutor behind you who will actually bring the case, you don't put the case together. So people need to understand that context. All right. Let me switch gears because I've heard all about uh, D.C. statehood. As those who study history know, D.C. was originally created uh, to form a city that did not or a, a location for the federal government to locate that would not give advantage to any one state, and it was created out of land from both Maryland and the Commonwealth of Virginia, our home state uh, attorney general. And, and so I've thought about this problem because the city's a lot larger than it was when it was originally founded, and there are a lot of permanent residents. And so for a number of years now, I've introduced a retrocession bill because when Virginia took back, or when the people in Virginia decided they didn't want to be a part of D.C. and everybody thought that was okay, they were given back to the Commonwealth of Virginia, and so Alexandria and parts of Arlington were originally a part of D.C. So I've had a retrocession bill in for some time, and I have one that, that would then take everything except the federal complexes um, and put it into the state of Maryland. Is this something that you think is appropriate? And while you're at it, let's talk about the constitutionality, because I've questioned whether the Virginia retrocession was constitutional. And clearly, if it was, then a retrocession of the territory currently located within the District of Columbia that originally belonged to Maryland could be also retrocessed or given back to the state of Maryland. And then all those folks would have the opportunity to vote for a congressional person and would no longer have the feeling that they've been cut out. Because I think they've got some legitimate concerns there, except that it was never intended to create a new state. It was always supposed to have been coming out of these two territories. And so that, to me, seems to be the better historical and constitutional answer. Would you agree and, and opine on that? Yeah, I, I agree on both counts. First of all, uh, that it is constitutional. Second of all, that it is n not only appropriate by opinion, it's appropriate by history. That's what happened on the Virginia side of the river. That's what ha should happen on the Maryland side of the river. Um, and the uh, founding generation that put the law in place to originally establish the 10 mile by 10 mile District of Columbia is viewed by courts as more because they also wrote the Constitution, who James Madison was noted as being involved in the formation of the District of Columbia where it is, um, also wrote the Constitution, the courts view laws passed at that time as more closely connected to the founding and thus more likely constitutional and the acts of this body start with a presumption of constitutionality to begin with. So then you fast forward to 1846 when Virginia got its property back, if you will, or its portion of the land back, um, and with no challenge, 
And so that is, in my view, it'd be a layup constitutionally to, uh, for your bill to pass constitutional muster as it's already been done in both directions. Um, and but I would, would be correct if it were deemed by the Supreme Court not to be constitutional, then you would have to take those portions of Virginia and put them back into the District of Columbia before you moved yeah, forward. Yeah, it is, is all correct? or nothing, yes. That's correct. So if they were to create statehood, it would only be appropriate that uh, Alexandria and parts of Arlington <laughs> would be returned to D.C. for statehood purposes as well, would it not? Uh, that Logically, yes, but the, the more historically appropriate course is for each state to get its territory back minus the federal buildings. And let me just clarify on the uh, challenge that we heard earlier, challenges to uh, electors in the, in the body is based on law and the 12th Amendment. And uh, it's interesting because there's a statement from Abraham Lincoln when electors were challenged in 1865 in the 18, from the 1864 election, and that many people on both sides of the aisle have voted for challenges over the years, including uh, my colleague who raised the issue. And I don't know what the, the folks who were storming the Capitol were thinking, but there were many of us who believed that what we were doing was following the Constitution, and so did the unanimous Supreme Court. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Frost is recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, here we go again. Committee Republicans are so adverse to actual oversight that they're trying to reinvent two of their most tired narratives. First off, Republicans, vote, uh, Repo Republicans act like the voters of D.C. are incapable of self-governance, so much for the party of small government. And second, Republicans cry out about rampant voter fraud to explain away the fact that they can't win over the majority of Americans when we talk about the people who are going to vote. The truth is that voter fraud incidents are scattered and amount to less than a rounding error in election results. We know that to be true. We heard a witness say, you're more likely to be struck by a bolt of lightning to find a legitimate uh, uh, voter fraud case. The truth is that DC election system is among the most accessible and secure in the nation. And so the truth is that Republicans are holding this hearing to try to push the ACE Act as part of their far-right extremist fantasy of election restrictions to help them hold power. And for people listening at home who don't know what, what's in this, let me tell you. Annual voter roll purges, restrictions on ballot drop boxes, an outright ban on same-day voter registration, an outright ban on ballot mailing programs that will disproportionately harm elderly people and folks with disabilities. Throwing away countless mail-in ballots, even if they are sent days before the polls close, and for now, stops just short of a poll tax and literacy test. Ms. Weiser, you're a Yale-educated attorney. You've taught at NYU Law. You're, you founded and directed the Voting Rights and Elections Project at the Brennan Center, and you spent your career focused on this issue. So I wanna ask your opinion on a few questions. Ms. Weiser, in your opinion, are there any legitimate reasons for Americans to believe that American elections, whether in 2016, 2020, or last year, are not secure? There's no legitimate reason to believe that there is any significant voter fraud in American elections. There are some threats to election integrity that Congress should address, um, but they are not voter fraud. And when we talk about election integrity, and we're talking about the ability for Congress to ensure that people can vote, that it's accessible, that it's simple, and that it's easy. Is that what you mean by ele election integrity? An election with integrity is indeed an election where every eligible American can cast a ballot. It is an election that um, is, has protections against efforts to sabotage and interfere with election outcomes and interfere in election administration. It is election free of violence and intimidation and an election with adequate security threats against cyber, uh, security protections against cyber security threats. Republican officials want to use hysteria and disinformation to justify stifling turnout because it seems like when more people vote, they end up losing. And it, to me, it seems like there's something wrong with your platform when you gotta keep people from voting in order to win. But Ms. Weiser, in your opinion, why might Americans believe that our election, specifically the 2020 election, lacked integrity? Unfortunately, we've seen a, a real um, aggressive wave of dismiss and malinformation about the integrity of the 2020 election. Um, 
court case after court case, election expert after election expert, um, and uh, government agency after government agency have all found that there was no vote significant fraud or misconduct, that it was one of the most secure, elect it was the most secure election in American history, and yet that is not what many Americans are hearing through their disinformation channels. Have you heard some of that disinformation on this committee today? Um, I, I have heard some uh, some false statements about the um, integrity of our elections. You know, every day I feel like I see my colleagues on the other side of the aisle mimicking what's going on in my state, where, and I worked for the ACLU and knocked doors for this to restore voting rights to over 1.4 million returning citizens in the state of Florida. And a large group of these folks who served their time went to register to vote, and by election officials were given a card that said you're registered to vote. Then, months later, to have a knock at their door to be arrested and put in jail by Ron DeSantis and the Republican Party in Florida that has created an uh, election police force to arrest people. Do things like that stifle turnout and mess with the integrity of our elections? We are deeply concerned with those kinds of um, official intimidation eff um, efforts. Um, we do believe that it is um, harming turnout, it is intimidating um, voters, not just um, returning citizens who are eligible to vote, but, but other voters. people in their community as well. And you want to know another thing that really gets to me? I cried when I saw those videos. There was things that were in common here. They were either black, Latino, or poor. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Ms. Ballant is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we certainly have work to do to overcome the dark, sordid past of suppressing voting in the United States. Poll taxes, literary, literacy tests, use of the grandfather clause, women being denied the right to vote, citizens who have attempted to vote. We have work to do to overcome this horrible history. And like the District of Columbia, my home state of Vermont has been working hard to make sure that we implement common sense strategies to make sure every eligible voter can vote. And one of those strategies is allowing same-day voter registration. So uh, Ms. Weiser, does same-day voter registration increase the number of eligible voters participating in our elections? Um, yes, it does. There are um, a, a long string of studies that show that it increases voter participation from you know, as much as um, from 3 to 9%. And is there any indication that um, same-day voter registration increases voter fraud. There is no, in, there is no evidence of um, a, a, a increase in voter fraud in states that have same-day registration. Um, their, their voter fraud rates are just as low as those in the rest of the country. Can you say that one more time? Because I think this is really, really important. Yes, th there is um, no factual connection between same-day registration and increased voter fraud that, um, that has been demonstrated or <laughs> anywhere in the country. So when a state like Vermont or District of Columbia makes a decision that one of the most important things that we can do as elected officials is to make sure anyone who is legally able to vote is easily able to vote, that is something that we should all be striving for, correct? I mean, we, sh we should be wanting more people to vote, not restricting people who are eligible to vote from voting. I, I agree with that. And, and I should note that the states that do have same-day registration have multiple layers of protection in place to ensure that it doesn't increase any risk of voter fraud. That's right. You know, one of the other things I was sitting here thinking about is that, you know, when you look at what's going on right now in this hearing and um, the issues that people of color has, have had to face throughout our history and are still facing just in, in being able to um, cast legal ballots. It, it's similar to the struggles that rural voters have had as well. And as a former middle school teacher, I think a lot about the, the students that I've had over the years that, that have been born into rural poverty in my state and may be born into a family that um, doesn't have a high level of education. And I was, in preparation for this hearing, I, I did some digging into the numbers, and um, over 18 million Americans who did not complete 
high school or only have a high school diploma do not have a driver's license. These are the people that are going to be turned away to vote because they do not have an ID. And so as my colleague Max Frost just said, it is about restricting people from voting, whether they are people of color, whether they are the poor, whether they are rural voters who do not have a high uh, income or educational level of attainment. And I, I can't understand why this is um, such a focus of my colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle to prevent Americans who are legally eligible to vote from voting. And can you help me understand this? What's going on here? So um, you know, I, I, I do support reasonable and non-discriminatory ID requirements. Americans should certainly have to demonstrate they are who they say they are. But what we are seeing and what um, has been raising significant concerns are these overly restrictive ID requirements, like what you're talking about, requiring people to show a driver's license to vote in a jurisdiction where uh, large numbers of people don't have driver's licenses that many Americans don't have. And that risks disenfranchising huge swaths of the population. Um, by our um, uh, earlier um, uh, research, um, up to 11% of Americans, and that is disproportionately in voters of color, voters with disability, elderly voters, young voters. And so, you know, it, my understanding is, is adults, make sure I get this right, adults who earn less than $30,000 a year are five times more likely not to have a driver's license than somebody that earns over $100,000 or more. I think it's really clear what's going on here, and um, I yield back. Jenny, uh, General Lady's time has expired. Ms. Crockett's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't really know where to begin, um, so we're going to start with uh, a few questions. Uh, I got a little a little quiz for y'all. Um, so we've been talking about the right to vote. I just need a yes or no from each of the witnesses, and we'll start with Ms. Weiser. Is voting a constitutionally protected federal right? Yes, it's constitutionally protected through multiple yes, provisions. You, okay. Ms. Evans, yes or no? Yes. Mr. Spies, yes or no? Yes. And Mr. Cuccellini, yes or no? It is constitutionally protected. Okay, thank you. Um, we've heard a lot of talk today about things such as buying alcohol. Ms. Weiser, is alcohol a federally protected constitutional right? It is not. Ms. Evans? It is not. Mr. Spies? No. Mr. Cuccinelli? Uh, Cuccinelli. Cuccinelli. You need an ID to buy it, but no. Okay. All right. And finally, uh, we like to talk about guns, or at least some people in this building love to talk about guns. Guns. Is there a, an amendment dealing with guns in our federal constitution? Yes. Ms. Evans? Yes. Mr. Spies? Spies, yes. Spies. And yes, sir? Yes, there is, and you need an ID to buy it. Okay, so let's talk about it. So I hail from the great state of Texas, and what's interesting to me is we always want to talk about privileges and compare what is required for a privilege versus comparing what is required for a constitutionally protected right under our federal constitution. And it's interesting that in this chamber, we love to talk about the Second Amendment and, and we wanna make sure that everyone has guns. And we only have one amendment in our constitution that deals with guns and it's the Second Amendment. And Professor Weiser, you were just about to say we have multiple provisions, so you were messing up my test a little bit. Um, so I'm not going to let you answer the question. I'm going to go down here to these experts. Let's start and go the other way. Do we know how many amendments actually address voting in our Constitution? Uh, well, it depends how you count them, but you could say three, fifth, okay. 14, 15th. Okay. Mr. Spees? Plus the D.C. I, amendments. And maybe first. Yeah. Yes, I would agree with that. Okay, Professor, go ahead and break it down. I, I believe it's six. There we go. There we go. So we got the 14th. We got the 15th, 17th. Wait a minute. Did I mess up? 19th, 24th, and 26th. There we go. 
All right, so we have six amendments. 23rd. And, and every time we dealt with an amendment dealing with voting, we were expanding upon access. Is that not correct? That is correct. That is the history of this country. Expanding okay. The, the history is to expand, but obviously there are some folk that want to rewrite history and make sure we go back in time. So let's also talk a little bit more about history for a couple of seconds. There was this little thing called the Voting Rights Act. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I am. Are you also familiar with this thing called uh, Bloody Sunday? Yes, indeed. Okay. So are you familiar with the fact that there are black folk that died in this country to make sure that black folk had access to the ballot box? Yes, that is correct. Are you also familiar with the fact that probably around 1913 or sometime around there, there was maybe a women's suffrage march? <laughs> yes. Yes. And that was a fight, again, for women to have access to the ballot box, was it not? Yes, it was. Okay, so we have had, throughout history, these fights to make sure that everyone is accessing the ballot box, but seemingly, when it comes down to, say, guns in this country, which are the number one killer of children in this country, we haven't had half as many hearings about guns as we've had on voting rights. And every time we seemingly have a hearing on voting rights, we're talking about the fact that people are cheating. So let's talk about who's cheating. I got a few articles. Uh, are you familiar with the fact that there was recently a settlement with this uh, little news company called Fox News? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, that was for about 780 something million dollars. Was it because they were lying about the, the elections? Yes, it was for a... Um, okay, there we go. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, there also was this article, because I don't want us to base anything on Georgia at all. Please, Jesus, not Georgia. Okay, because Georgia purged 87,000... Will the gentlewoman yield? Not, I think I Georgia not, matters. I will not yield. I am reclaiming my time. All right, so there were 87,000 people that were purged that were legitimate voters. So, no, we don't want to copy off of Georgia. Um, also, another GOP voter admits he committed fraud... Another one in Pennsylvania, man who admits he voted for Trump with his dead mom's name because he listened to too much propaganda. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentlelady from the state of Georgia, Ms. Green, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to remind everyone that Georgia's votes matter, and everyone should care about each state in the United States of America and voter rights. And I would also like to remind everyone that in order to buy a gun, you have to have a valid ID. That's required. Um, just like voters should have a valid ID. Talking about the state of Georgia in the 2020 election, my ex-husband showed up to vote uh, for President Trump, myself, and, and other candidates that he wanted to support. And when he showed up to vote, he was told that he had already voted by absentee ballot. And he said, no, that's not true. I haven't voted by absentee ballot. As a matter of fact, I didn't even request an absentee ballot. And they said, well, Mr. Green, it shows right here on the Secretary of State website that you've already voted by absentee ballot. And he said, well, that's not true. I haven't voted. I would like to vote here in person. That's what I'm, I'm doing. And so they made him sign a form surrendering a ballot that he never requested and never voted on so that he could vote in person. And he was deeply troubled by this. He was upset by it. But what bothered him even more is there was a whole line of voters there that day that were doing the same thing. We carried on, and he had to go through quite a lengthy legal process to find out what happened, and he still hasn't found out, found out why someone was able to vote with an absentee ballot in his name. He also never found out what happened to that absentee ballot if it was thrown out and who they voted for. You see, there are problems in our elections, and it's important to remember. We saw many of them in the 2020 election. We saw suitcases pulled out from uh, tables, uh, suitcases of ballots. And then here, we just saw in the news that a postal service released his final report. Contract driver Jesse Morgan vindicated because he had been trying to say that he hauled trailer, a trailer of ballots from New York to Pennsylvania in late October 2020. These things matter. And Democrats know they matter too because in 2019, Democrat senators Klobuchar, Warner, Reed, and Peters had all wrote a letter of how concerned they were because intelligence agents uh, were saying that elections 
were in danger of being hacked by foreign nationals or foreign countries because election machines could be hacked. Now, I think that's problematic, and I think everyone can agree that we don't want foreign countries or foreigners meddling in our elections. Um, and so my question would be, um, if, if this is such a deep concern, uh, Ms. Weiser, Ms. Ms. Evans, uh, Mr. Spees, Mr. Spees, Mr. Cuccinelli, one by one, could you say yes or no if you agree that we don't want foreign actors meddling in our elections? Ms. Weiser, let me start with you. That is correct. We don't want foreign actors meddling in our elections. As director of DC Board of Elections, I make no opinion statements. No opinion. That's a yes or no, Ms. Evans. I provide no opinions in my role as the executive director of the District of Columbia. So you're Board unable elections. to have it. How do you do your job if you can't give an opinion or an answer? Seems like you'd be unfit to serve in the job that you have if you're unable to provide a yes or no answer on foreign actors meddling in United States elections. My job is to administer the laws as they've been provided in the District of Columbia, and I perform my job with integrity, and I know my job well, mm -hmm. and that is my responsibility. So you're not unable not to, to say no, so we'll take that as a yes. You agree with foreign actors meddling in, in United States elections. Mr. Spees? Strongly oppose it. They, Mr. Cuccinelli? Also oppose it, including non-citizens voting. I agree. Um, the House passed a resolution of disapproval with 42 Democrats voting with Republicans um, about the D.C. law that was passed last year called Local Residents Voting Rights Amendment Act. Local, you would think that would be United States of American residents, um, not non-citizens. Uh, but that, that allows... Here, this law passed that you obviously support, support foreigners uh, meddling in our elections, is foreign diplomats, people that work at embassies, illegals, and foreign nationals allowed to vote in the District of Columbia elections. Um, so you can tell that Democrats disagree with this because 42 Dems voted against it. Um, Democrat senators, again, four of them wrote a letter very concerned about foreign countries and our intelligence agencies are concerned about this. And you know what? Most Americans are. Um, and that, that is a very serious, serious problem. Um, with that, my time has expired, and I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back. Point of order, the, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's recognized what is the, for the point of order. Thank you. If a witness uh, declines to answer a question on the grounds that he or she cannot answer the question, uh, is it appropriate to state for the record that the answer is yes? Uh, because I, I would like to correct the record, because I, I think that cuts against everything we understand about the dynamics of hearings. The, the, the ranking member's comments are noted. Uh, the, the gentlewoman's uh, comments stand on the record. Okay, and the witness's uh, comments will stand on, on their the, own. The, the, the witness is, uh, is more than welcome to provide additional commentary and writing following the conclusion of the hearing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No further parliamentary inquiries. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for five minutes, Mr. Timmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, one of the bedrock principles of uh, functioning democracy is confidence in the outcome of our elections. And obviously with COVID came a number of changes to uh, state election laws that were done so uh, in violation of uh, the Constitution. So I guess I want to start by asking Ms. Evans, um, were changes made to uh, the manner in which D.C. conducted its elections because of COVID? Yes. And how were those, was it a council vote? Did, who, who approved and who authorized those changes? There were different changes made. Um, I can't say there's a wholesale answer. Did to city council vote on those changes? Um, there were changes that were made with the authority that the D.C. Board of Elections currently has. To the D.C. Changes. Board of Elections does not DC, have authority to change the election. Not laws. change the election. As the decisions were made um, regarding the election, the D.C. Council did pass emergency legislation during the um, height of the pandemic. Yes. Did any judge change your election laws? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Well. Um, you know, we've had a lot of issues with uh, confidence in the outcome of the 2020 elections because many unelected bureaucrats, some elected officials, and 
uh, federal judges and state judges and a wide variety of people made changes to election laws that are not allowed under the Constitution. So South Carolina, uh, and you know, I, I guess people don't realize this. People always say the Supreme Court turned down every, every argument, every, every case that was challenging the outcome of any election. And that's actually not true. That's not true. One case was heard on the merits, and it was unanimously um, voted on by the Supreme Court as it relates to South Carolina's unconstitutional changes that were done by a federal judge. So what happened is the General Assembly appropriately got together and said, we have a pandemic and we want to keep people safe. And they made changes to the state of South Carolina's election laws in accordance with the Constitution. And a group of people that uh, did this across the country got together and tried to change our election laws in South Carolina. And the federal judge, I can guess, you can guess who appointed her, um, overturned the state's recently adopted COVID-friendly election laws. And it was kind of chaotic. Um, Fourth Circuit uh, originally overturned her, then overturned the, the initial ruling, and then the Supreme Court, nine to zero, uh, said that the federal judge was not entitled to make changes to South Carolina's election laws because that's just not how the system works. So the same thing happened in Arizona and Georgia and Pennsylvania and all states all over the country. And that's why people didn't trust the outcome of uh, the election. Who knows whether those changes would have made a difference, but um, you know, the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals uh, the dissenting opinion said, we know for a fact that 15 plus thousand people voted that were not legally entitled to vote because a judge changed when the, pers when, when the registration deadline was and that was not within their purview to do. So, uh, you know, we have all these challenges across this country and I hope that we can learn from them. I hope that we can learn from uh, the mistakes that were made. I, I realize that the pandemic has justified so many decisions so many decisions, and I think um, reasonable minds can differ at the time whether those were appropriate, but I think in retrospect, many of the decisions made uh, during the pandemic were not in the best interest of uh, our citizenry and did in fact not help um, to push this country forward, to, to overcome it. So, um, you know, whether D.C. legally or uh, unconstitutionally allowed everybody uh, to vote that, I mean, y'all had 50,000 ballots that were returned as undeliverable, is that right? 48,000, 18, is that correct, Ms. Evans? Which election are you referencing? Uh, the 2020 election. Uh, the stat I'm looking at here says that <coughs> you sent out 421 yeah. uh, ballots ahead. Universal mail-in voting doesn't work. It doesn't facilitate confidence. I would argue that the fact that 11.4% were returned as undeliverable is exactly why universal mail-in voting is ridiculous. But um, I guess reasonable minds can differ. Uh, one last thing, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a 2016 report from the DC auditor showing that DC did in fact fail its own audit. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Without objection, and the gentleman yields back. Um, in consultation with the ranking member, uh, we'd like to give each of our witnesses uh, two minutes for closing remarks. Uh, then the ranking member and I will each take four minutes for closing remarks. We'll then gavel uh, the committee hearing closed. Um, we'll start with you, uh, Ms. Weiser, uh, if you'd like to uh, say anything in, in conclusion of the hearing, uh, up to two minutes. Um, thank you very much for this hearing. I, I, I wanted to close where I started by underscoring what I believe are serious risks to um, our elections um, heading into um, going forward from disinformation that is sowing distrust about the elections, fueling vote suppression efforts, causing people to try to tamper with election equipment and meddle in election results, and fueling a climate of um, harassment and even violence. I think these are really serious risks. These are things that con I really do hope Congress will take seriously and address nationally, not just focused on DC. And I strongly urge this Congress to revisit and pass the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act, which actually would address each and every one of these problems. And as well, I want to make sure that Congress um, also ensures 
the local self-determination for DC's residents and um, grant them full um, citizenship and statehood um, uh, in, in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. General Lady Yields. Uh, Ms. Evans, you're recognized for up to two minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I'd just like to say that in DC, we take elections very seriously, and I take my job very seriously. I've heard um, allegations that we have no desire to find fraud in the District of Columbia. That is untrue. We do have measures in place to address list maintenance. We not only have measures to be transparent, but we are increasing those efforts, including with the recently passed Elections and Modern Modernization Amendment Act, where we are developing a visualization data board that will be accessible and available to the public. There has been testimony regarding what the citizens in the District of Columbia want. To my knowledge, I do not know that the residents of the District of Columbia have been asked, polled, or um, voted on the testimony um, items that have been provided today. And um, finally, I'd just like to say again that as far as my role as the Executive Director, DC Board of Elections, I do not introduce pass, nor do I opine on legislation. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Spees, you're recognized for up to two minutes. I was pleased to hear uh, Mr. Frost reference uh, the Florida election reforms, and I think those are important to circle back to because those were, became effective in mid-2021 for the 2022 elections. Uh, when those reforms were passed, the Brennan Center uh, criticized them and used a lot of this rhetoric we're hearing about disenfranchising people. But the interesting thing about Florida is we've now seen the results. And we've seen that the results of those reforms was not to disenfranchise people, but in fact to have record turnout across all demographics in Florida in a smoothly run election. This is important because those reforms that were passed are largely the basis of what we're seeing with the ACE Act. And if we can get that passed in DC, that can then be a model for the rest of the country. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the, Mr. Cuccinelli is recognized for two minutes. Uh, I, I would just dovetail Mr. Spee's comment and note that we, we've heard presumptions here today that uh, your vote is almost determined by the tone of your skin color. And in the Florida election of 2022, Ron DeSantis won 60% of the Hispanic vote after passing those election reforms and with the turnout that Mr. Spees referenced. So while Democrats may assume that skin color determines thought, I do not, and nor do many others who believe in election integrity. Uh, I would note that Ms. Torres raised a question challenging my integrity, whether explicitly or implicitly, um, and has sent a letter to me asking me about my prior testimony. I stand by all of my prior sworn testimony and response to her letter. Um, Congresswoman Bice referenced, and as did um, the witness to my right, Mr. Spees, the popularity of voter identification in polling. I would note that in the Michigan ballot measure this year, that um, the side running the ballot measure, which gutted, it eliminated the ID requirement, they passed that ballot measure. And they did it by telling voters with millions of dollars that it protected voter ID. That's how they passed it. They lied through their teeth. And in doing so, they adopted the position that is included in the ACE Act, they suggested that the ballot measure would accomplish the same as the ACE Act in terms of voter identification. Um, and last but not least, uh, the whole talk of DC statehood is a power play um, by the Democrat Party with a 90% voter uh, advantage in DC. That's two more senators. If they're true to history, they will just give the property back and the people will go back to Maryland where they will have two senators and they will have a congressman and not a delegate, as I keep hearing is desired. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, I ask unanimous consent to submit a statement into the record from the League of Women Voters of the United States and the League of Women Voters of the District of Columbia. Thank you. Without objection. I, I now recognize uh, the ranking member, uh, Mr. Raskin, for four minutes for closing remarks. No, thank you kindly, Mr. Chairman. Um,
I also want to just uh, clean up a little bit of the, the debris, the flotsam and jetsam left over from this hearing, uh, which uh, you have uh, presided over in admirable fashion, uh, Mr. Chairman. So thank you for that. The first thing is uh, Mr. Griffith, who I'm, I'm afraid is not with us now, um, th made the bizarre point that he thinks that we all agree that there was no Russian interference in our election in 2016. I think anybody who is paying attention, who's studied the historical record, um, determines the issue in exactly the opposite fashion. Um, more than a dozen different national security agencies, including the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, the Director of National Intelligence, the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, the House Intelligence Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, all determined that Vladimir Putin had uh, a plan. He had a whole operation in place, the Internet Research Agency, which they put hundreds of millions of dollars in precisely to interfere in the American presidential election and destabilize it. Now, there's obviously dispute about to what extent Donald Trump coordinated with them. Some people think Donald Trump had nothing to do with it. And when he said, Russia, if you're listening, find me those 30,000 email or when they met with uh, Russian operatives at Trump Tower, that all of that was just accidental or whatever. But in any event, put that to the side. Nobody serious is doubting that there was a Russian campaign to interfere in an election in 2016. So I was alarmed that he was engaged in that degree of Orwellian whitewashing of our actual history. Here's Marco Rubio, the Republican senator from Florida, who's then the acting chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, who said, we found irrefutable evidence of Russian meddling in the 2016 election. So I wanted to clear that up because these things have a, a way of changing people's minds for no reason. Secondly, um, on the matter of uh, non-citizen voting, which has become kind of a big deal um, in this hearing, I would just encourage everybody to study the history of it. I, I have no uh, dog in the hunt. This is up to the people of DC whether they want uh, uh, non-citizens to join the overwhelmingly citizen population of DC and voting in school board and ANC and city council elections. That's up to them, just like it's up to the people of Little Rock or Juneau, Alaska or Dallas, Texas. So I, I've got no uh, horse in that race. But I will tell you that uh, some people uh, in this hearing were vehemently denouncing the practice as un-American, unconstitutional, and so on, without understanding remotely the history of this practice, which was pervasive throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, precisely because the states wanted to welcome immigrants to their population and give them the right to vote as a way to get them interested in local affairs. And I think Mr. Cuccinelli uh, properly quoted me when someone said, well, what about uh, you know, Russian agents at the Russian embassy? And I said, if I had a vote in DC, which I don't, I would certainly vote to exclude them from participating because it's been proven that they are up to no good and are trying to subvert uh, our democracy. But uh, it's up to the people of DC how they want to deal with the issue of their local elections. Finally, about the matter at hand, the people of Washington, D.C. are the residents of the only national capital on planet Earth who are not represented in their own national legislature. These are tax-paying, draftable, law-abiding U.S. citizens, 700,000 of them, a population larger than that of two states, and yet they are completely excluded from voting representation in the Congress that makes decisions central to their lives about judicial nominations, about war and peace, about federal budget, and so on. That's the critical voting rights issue. Everything else is a sideshow and a distraction from that. Let's get back to what we were doing in the last Congress. Let's pass DC statehood, and let's keep the march of democracy and freedom going in America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The, the gentleman yields back. Um, I appreciate all of our witnesses being here today. I think what we heard is the need to pass the ACE Act. Time and again, we heard the challenges we face in Washington, D.C. and across the country uh, for lax voter integrity laws and an opportunity to strengthen voter integrity. Uh, we had testimony uh, from our witnesses about the implications uh, that strong voter integrity provisions have. Uh, we highlighted Florida. We highlighted Georgia. Uh, we reviewed the rhetoric from last year from the left, from President Biden and others, who called the Georgia voter integrity law, Jim Crow 2.0, a whole host of uh, flawed arguments. And then the empirical data came forward and actually showed that by putting in place strong voter integrity provisions, what we actually got was higher participation and more people appreciating the process. It's my firm belief that when you have strong voter integrity provisions,
What you actually do is enhance people's confidence in their elections, and when, in, when confidence is enhanced, more people are likely to vote. And I think there's some real common sense provisions that we put in this, in particular as it relates to Washington, D.C. We talked about how you need a photo ID to buy a six-pack of beer if you're a resident of D.C., to board an airplane. We heard people talk about their Second Amendment rights and the need for a photo ID there. So it's completely rational to think that putting forward photo ID for the right to vote uh, actually enhances confidence in our elections. Uh, it was brought up again uh, by my, my colleague uh, about the impact of non-citizens voting. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ranking Member, you, you noted that you'd be happy to make sure that Russian and Chinese agents that are hostile to the United States interests aren't able to vote. I'd ask you to take a hard look at the ACE Act and consider supporting it, because what it does is it prevents Chinese and Russian agents from being able to vote in Washington, D.C. I think that's a pretty common sense thing. I think it's absolutely ridiculous to think that somebody who works on the embassy staff of a foreign country is going to pull out a foreign passport and walk up and vote in a Washington, D.C. election because they've been in the nation's capital for 30 days. There's an estimated 20 to 40,000 individuals who are 18 years of age, who've been in D.C. for 30 days, who are citizens of another country, a healthy chunk of them working for foreign countries while being here in the nation's capital. I think it's pretty reasonable to make sure that those individuals aren't voting. We know that in Washington, D.C., in the 2022 election, 500 ballots were sent out that were incorrect. Well, it sure gives you a lot of pause when you realize that in addition to that, we have voter rolls in Washington, D.C. that are not as up-to-date as they could be. So it's rational to think that if you have non-citizens voting, that all sorts of things could go on and individuals who are on the voter rolls could find themselves able to vote in a federal election, which is ridiculous. The ASAC provides the tools for Washington, D.C. to be able to prevent that. We stopped the sending of unsolicited ballots. We talked about the implications that that's had in Washington, D.C., where multiple ballots were sent in previous elections unsolicited by people on an unmaintained voter list. Those types of things don't enhance people's confidence in our elections. The ACE Act resolves that. In our hearing opened with a comment from one of my colleagues that was disappointed we were even here having this conversation in the first place. If the cameras were flipped around and saw the attendance in this room, I'd suggest that it's, pretty, it's a great idea to be having this conversation. We've got a lot of people here who are interested in this. Instead of H.R. 1, which was shoved through with no amendments, two quick hearings, a federal takeover of our election law, what we've done, starting before the 2020 election, began building this legislation so that we are in a position to discuss it, to amend it, to make it as strong as we can, and ultimately to pass it to have the most substantive and strongest election integrity bill pass the House of Representatives in over 20 years. With that, I'll, I'll yield to myself and say and, and thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Appreciate your testimony. Appreciate the ranking member for working with me in this. Um, and each member of the committee uh, may have a, some additional questions uh, for our witnesses. Uh, we ask that you please respond in writing to those questions without objection. Uh, each member will have five legislative days to insert additional material into the record or to revise and extend their remarks. Now, pursuant to paragraph C of House Rule 14, of Rule 14 of the Committee on House Administration, uh, I hereby appoint William Johnson Assistant Clerk of the Committee, and I'll request unanimous consent that the letter appointing the Assistant Clerk be entered into the official record. A copy of the letter will be made available to all members of the committee. And if there's no further business, I Mr. think- Mr. Chairman, could I just ask you to consent to enter two documents into the record? W the, the, the documents the, are? A study by Professor Charles Stewart in the MIT Election Data and Science Lab on how we voted in 2022, discussing confidence going up in our elections in a letter from Common Cause um, about uh, how more secret dark money would be allowed in our elections under the legislation. Concern. Without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, with no further business, I thank the members for their participation. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. way through that. Yep. Thank you, sir. Thank you.